My name's Cade Warren, and this happened to me on October 17, 2014, deep in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Been working these woods my whole life, just like my pappy before me. Knew them trails like the back of my hand, thought nothing could surprise me anymore. Guess I was wrong about that. It began with a missing persons case. Two college kids on a weekend camping trip gone off the grid. Folks get lost up in these mountains all the time, but something about this felt different. No sign of their gear, no sign of them at all, not a trace. Now that set off alarm bells. Started wondering if maybe some drifter or escaped con was hiding out, preying on the unwary. I was tasked with leading the search party up into the higher elevations where they'd last been seen. We went in packing heavy. Rifles, emergency supplies, the works. Wasn't expecting to find some Boy Scouts out for a casual hike. The woods felt heavy, air thick even for autumn. Team was on edge too, a sense that we weren't alone out there. We made camp that night in a narrow valley, intending to continue the search at daybreak. After dinner, I decided to take a perimeter walk. Old ranger habits die hard. Straight a little ways from the firelight, just scanning the tree line. That's when I heard it. A rustling sound, then a low, guttural growl. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Wasn't no animal I recognized. Back at camp, everyone was asleep. It was probably nothing I told myself. Probably some half-starved coyote. Yet I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I spent the rest of the night listening to the symphony of crickets punctuated by the occasional snap of a branch, the hoot of an owl, and something else. Something that sounded far too big, far too close for comfort. The next morning broke cold and clear. We began our search again, spreading out to cover more ground. Hours passed without a sign. I found myself gravitating to the areas most overgrown, the tangled thickets of rhododendron. Something told me these kids hadn't wandered far from where they began. By midday, two of my team were getting jumpy. They'd heard those noises too, swore they saw shadows just out of sight. It wasn't their imaginations. Then, just ahead, the bushes trembled and a massive shape burst forth. For a moment, my mind went blank. This thing was a nightmare made flesh, standing at least nine feet tall, caked in mud and who knows what else. It was impossibly strong-looking, muscles rippling beneath a coat of thick black fur. The head was hard to describe, small and hunched forward, with a flat protruding snout and tiny black eyes full of predatory cunning. It roared, bearing rows of vicious teeth, and that's when the smell hit me, like rotting meat and something altogether fouler. I shouted for the team to fall back, raising my rifle and firing off warning shots. The thing flinched, then charged forward, its speed terrifying. We fell back in disarray, firing as we went. The creature barreled forward, heedless of the gunfire. It lunged at a young ranger named Beth, its clawed hand the size of a bear trap raking across her torso. She screamed, then crumpled to the ground. Chaos then. Shots rang out, and the creature let out an enraged roar. I saw it grab another ranger, Tom, and toss him aside like a broken doll. Then, as suddenly as it materialized, it was gone, vanishing into the undergrowth with impossible agility. I sprinted to Beth, the world blurring around me. Blood soaked through my hands as I tried to stop the bleeding. Her eyes stared lifelessly up at the sky. Tom's fate wasn't much better. He lay sprawled against a tree, legs mangled, neck twisted at an unnatural angle. Only one other ranger, Jensen, had escaped unscathed, his face pale with shock. The three of us were all that remained of the search party, left staring at the mangled remains of our comrades. The creature had moved off. It could be anywhere, watching us, stalking, waiting. We radioed for backup, voices trembling. 
but who the hell would believe us? Ranger deaths, sure. Animal attack, maybe. But a hulking, unidentified monster that shrugged off gunfire? Backup came, of course. Armed support, even a chopper circling overhead. What they didn't find was the creature. They did find the bodies, the campsite ransacked, and the remnants of an animal carcass nearby, torn to bloody ribbons. They also found footprints, huge prints unlike anything in the official wildlife guides. The official report went with mountain lion attack. Easier to swallow, I suppose. Easier to avoid the media frenzy and uncomfortable questions about what else lurked out there. It didn't bring back Beth or Tom, didn't change the fact that whatever we encountered that day wasn't natural, wasn't simply part of the ecosystem. They told me to take leave, said I was suffering shock, trauma. Maybe they were right, but I couldn't sit still, couldn't forget the creature's malevolent glare, the sickening reek of its fur, couldn't forget Beth's last, terrified scream. Left the mountains for a while, drifted, did odd jobs. But the nightmares followed me. Now, I'm back. Not working as a ranger anymore, at least not officially. I patrol different wilderness areas now, the sprawling forests and swamplands, chasing rumors of hunters disappearing, hikers vanishing. I leave notes, warnings for those brave enough or foolish enough to venture into the deepest parts of the backcountry. Beware, predator at large. Someone has to do it. Someone has to stand between the innocent and the things that lurk in the shadows. It's a lonely existence, a thankless one. And one of these days, that creature, or one of its kin, will find me again. I know that. Accept that. It's an ugly world sometimes. But even the ugliest truths need to be brought to light. My pursuit became an obsession. I'd spot a story in the local papers, an unexplained disappearance in some remote corner of the country, and I'd be on the road. Each new location offered a twisted puzzle. Tracks defying identification, half-eaten animal carcasses, the lingering whispers of terrified witnesses. I'd camp alone in the woods for weeks, my senses always on high alert, waiting for the slightest hint of movement, the faintest whiff of that putrid musk in the air. I started keeping even more detailed records. I meticulously cataloged each encounter, each footprint or shredded campsite, cross-referenced the sightings, mapped likely hunting ranges. Those creatures weren't random. There were patterns emerging, a preference for dense, old-growth forest, a tendency to stick to the fringes of civilization. They were intelligent, adaptable, and they were becoming bolder. The obsession came at a cost. Relationships unraveled. Anyone who stuck around long enough saw the haunted look in my eyes, the way I'd jump at every creaking floorboard. My savings dwindled, replaced by a collection of worn trail boots, battered binoculars and a shotgun that rarely left my side. Didn't matter. This was bigger than any one person. One trail led north, way up into the isolated forests along the U.S.-Canadian border. There, I befriended a wiry, weathered old trapper named Hank, one of the few who believed my outlandish tales. Hank swore he'd seen something monstrous up on the ridgeline above his cabin, something that snatched one of his traps clean off its chain, a trap that could hold a grizzly. We spent a week up in those woods, laying out extra traps, cameras, waiting for the creature to return. It did, on the fourth night, but it wasn't alone. I woke to Hank's panicked shouts and gunfire ripping through the darkness. I scrambled out of my tent, sleep-fogged and disoriented. The clearing in front of Hank's cabin was a scene of utter chaos. Hank was slumped against the porch already gone, his chest ripped open by monstrous claws. One of the creatures, the same massive brute I remembered from the Smokies, stood over his body blood dripping from its fangs. It turned, pinning me in the glare of those beady, malevolent eyes. A younger, smaller creature flanked it, fur dappled with Hank's fresh blood. Rage and grief ignited within me. 
This was personal now. I raised my rifle and fired, a desperate act of defiance. The bigger creature snarled, swiping a massive paw in my direction. I dove for cover, rolling behind the remains of Hank's woodshed. Splinters flew as the creature demolished the structure with brute force. I was pinned down, heart pounding like a war drum. Another gunshot, the younger creature cried out in pain. I risked a glance and saw it limping away into the trees, a streak of red trailing behind. One down, at least. But the larger one, the real threat, was still focused on ripping me to shreds. Hope flared when a vehicle roared up the dirt path leading to the cabin. Two figures, strangers, leaped out armed to the teeth. They'd heard the commotion. They shouted, We're here to help. For a fleeting second, I believed salvation had arrived. But something was wrong. Their movements were jerky, awkward, their expressions fixed. Then I noticed the way their eyes gleamed in the moonlight. Those same small, black, unnaturally intelligent eyes. More of those creatures wearing human skin. I opened my mouth to shout a warning, but it was too late. The two newcomers turned their guns on me. The first shot slammed into my shoulder, sending me sprawling. Another tore through the flimsy cover of the woodshed. The hulking creature was closing in, sensing my vulnerability, relishing the kill. This was it. After all those years, all those solitary miles, it would end not with a hero's stand, but a desperate demise in this remote, blood-soaked clearing. Then, as if called from a nightmare, a new sound split the air. It started as a low rumble, rising to a deep, ground-shaking roar. Something dark and impossibly huge crashed through the tree line. The creatures, including the one closing in on me, froze, confusion replacing their bloodlust. From the shadows emerged a bear, but a bear, like none I'd ever seen. Twice the size of a grizzly, with a broad chest and claws the length of machetes. Its eyes blazed with not just animal fury, but a chilling, primal intelligence. It charged the creatures with a roar that rattled my bones. The bear was a blur of fur and teeth. One of the disguised creatures barely had time to raise its gun before the bear ripped it apart in a spray of blood. The other fled, scrambling for its truck. The monstrous creature that had stalked me, the killer of Beth and Tom, hesitated, then turned to face this new threat. What followed was a clash of titans. The bear and the creature tore into each other, the clearing shaking with the force of their blows. I scrambled to my feet, my wounded shoulder screaming in protest. The newcomer's truck sputtered to life, its tires spinning as it disappeared down the dirt track. I fumbled with my rifle, but the fight raged beyond my ability to intervene. This was their battle now, fought for reasons I couldn't fathom. And as quickly as it started, it was over. The creature, outmatched in sheer size and power, lay crumpled on the blood-soaked ground. The giant bear stood above it, breathing heavily, a fresh gash across its flank. It turned its massive head and looked directly at me. And in that moment, I felt a surge of understanding. This bear, this impossibly large protector of the wilds, it was connected to those creatures in a way I didn't grasp part of some ancient balance I was only beginning to glimpse. The bear lumbered away, disappearing back into the trees with the same eerie silence it had appeared from. I stood there, shaking. The world tilted on its axis. As dawn spilled over the clearing, I saw the damage in stark light. Hank's lifeless form. The monstrous corpses, still unsettlingly human-like the remnants of a battle that defied understanding. The aftermath is a blur. I made the call, gave the report filled with words like bear attack, unknown assailants. More lies to cover up a truth too dangerous to tell. They buried Hank and cleaned up the clearing, sanitizing the scene into something explainable, something easy to forget. I continue to wander, following the trail of blood and whispers. That battle up north changed me. Now, 
I'm not just a hunter, but a witness to a hidden world, a world where nature itself fights back against the crawling darkness. The quest isn't about killing those creatures anymore. It's about learning, about understanding the forces at play out there, and maybe, just maybe, finding a way for all of us, human and other, to survive together. Vive. This happened to me on July 4, 2011, out in the Olympic National Forest in Washington. Love those woods, the moss hanging off the trees like something out of a fairy tale, the ferns, that deep green you don't find anywhere else. Always been a quiet, introverted guy, so the solitude of the forest suited me better than city life ever could. Name's Everett. That July 4, I had a solo shift. Most folks were off at barbecues or crowding the beach, so it was just me monitoring the trails. There'd been a rash of bear sightings reported over the last few weeks, so I was on alert. But mostly the day unfolded in uneventful routine. Checked in on a few campers, rerouted some lost hikers. Nothing out of the ordinary. Near dusk, a call came over the radio. A panicked voice, a woman saying her hiking partner Rowan had wandered off and wasn't responding to her calls. She'd been looking for nearly an hour and was starting to lose her cool. Something felt off. Rowan was an experienced hiker, according to the woman, the kind who knew not to leave the trail. I promised to meet them at the trailhead, tried to calm the woman down, but a gnawing worry settled at the base of my spine. I found the woman, Anya, pacing back and forth in the parking lot, the setting sun cast long shadows, and the air had taken on that evening chill. Anya jumped when she saw me, rambling about Rowan and how they'd had a small argument earlier, something stupid. Guilt hung heavy in her voice. We started up the trail, me in the lead. Anya called out Rowan's name every few steps, but only the rustling trees answered back. As the last of the daylight slipped away, I pulled out my flashlight. Its beam cut through the growing darkness, illuminating the narrow path ahead. That's when I found Rowan's pack, lying abandoned off to one side of the trail. Anya let out a choked cry. I told her to stay put, then moved closer, my senses on high alert. No signs of a struggle, but a weird energy clung to the pack, a sense of something wrong. Shuffling, a branch snapping in the distance. I spun shone the flashlight beam deeper into the undergrowth. There was a flash of movement, not an animal, too upright. Then it was gone, swallowed by the thick vegetation. My heart hammered a panic tattoo against my ribs. Rowan? I called out. This isn't funny. Anya hurried over. Fear had blanched her face, her eyes wide and frantic. Something rustled in the bushes again, louder this time. It was coming closer. We gotta move. I said, my voice tight. Stay behind me. The next few minutes were a blur of adrenaline and terror. That thing stalked us. We could hear it, rustling leaves, grunting breaths, always just outside the reach of the flashlight beam. Twice I caught glimpses. A flash of greasy pale hide stretched over an unnaturally tall frame, long arms ending in fingers tipped with claws like chipped obsidian, and the head too small for the body, eyes that glowed amber in the darkness. Every fiber of my being screamed at me to run, but I forced myself to keep a slow, steady pace. If we panicked, bolted, I knew that would be it. The parking lot lights glimmered ahead, a beacon in the sea of black trees. We burst out of the tree line, collapsing at the edge of the asphalt. Anya sobbed, half in terror and half in relief. That's when the other rangers found us, drawn out by the commotion. I kept trying to describe what I'd seen, but they looked at me like I was crazy. Maybe I was. Anya kept mumbling that Rowan was hurt, or lost, that we needed to go back for him. I held her back, told her it wasn't safe, but I knew in my gut, we'd never find Rowan. 
not alive at least. When backup arrived, they scoured the forest for hours. Nothing. No trace of Rowan, no sign of the creature. The official report chalked it up to an animal attack, or Rowan getting lost and succumbing to the elements. After all, hadn't he been missing for hours by the time we even began searching? They told me to take some time off, said it had been a stressful situation. I didn't argue. Couldn't tell them the truth. That what I had seen didn't fit with any bear or cougar. That Rowan's disappearance was my fault for getting them out on the trail so late. Instead, I packed my things and drove away from the Olympic forest. Never looked back. Took a desk job. Logistics stuff, mostly. So I wouldn't have to patrol the forests anymore. Some nights, I lie awake. The smell of damp earth and a deeper, cloying rot filling my nose. I'm haunted by the image of those amber eyes. By the cracking of branches. The shuffling steps following close behind. It makes me wonder how many cases like Rowan's get written off, how many disappearances dismissed as animal attacks or wanderings when it's something far worse lurking out there. That creature. Was it some twisted, starved creature of the woods, or something else entirely? And if it took Rowan, who's to say it stopped hunting? Every time I pass a stretch of dense woods, I swear I feel a prickle on the back of my neck, and I wonder if it's out there watching me, waiting for the day I wander too far off the path. It isn't just animals to be wary of out there. There are darker things, too. I tell myself it's over, that whatever happened is buried back there in the Olympic forest. But every time I hear a news report about another missing hiker, a gnawing guilt claws at my guts. I know Rowan didn't get lost. We both know what happened to him. They should call it the snare. I think sometimes, because that's what it does, snares you with promises of solitude, of open trails, and then it closes in. I can only hope Anya found someone, somehow, to tell her story to, someone who wouldn't brush her fears aside as a woman in hysterics, because whatever's lurking out there in the woods, in those shadowed places where the paths end and the flashlight beams can't reach, it's still out there. And as long as people wander alone into the wild, it's still hunting. It happened about a decade back when I was still green as alligator hide, working as a ranger at Shark Valley Visitor Center. I'm Jasper, by the way. Grew up running fishing lines out here with my old man, so the whole swamp ecosystem felt like home. I knew the gators, the birds, the sneaky little water snakes. Hell, I even knew which patch of sawgrass was likely to have you sinking into muck up to your knees if you weren't careful. What I didn't know, what no one tells you, is that there are things out here older and a whole lot meaner than anything in the guidebooks. The night it began, I was doing a routine patrol, nothing special. The Everglades get a certain kind of still when the sun goes down punctuated by the croak of frogs and the rustle of critters you don't want to get close to. There was a full moon out, painting the water in streaks of silver. Should have been peaceful, but I couldn't shake the sense something was watching me. Every shadow stretched a little too long, every splash felt purposeful. That's when I saw it. A busted-up canoe beached along the bank, half-submerged in the reeds. Not an uncommon sight, Folks get careless out here, misjudge the current. But what gave me pause were the streaks of red smeared across the wood, like someone had dragged a bleeding animal over the side. I radioed it in, standard procedure. Mostly to hear another human voice in the rising quiet. The dispatcher didn't sound too worried. Figures it was a gator who'd made a big catch. I wasn't so sure myself, so I went to check it out. Big mistake. The canoe was old, weathered, the kind that seasoned locals use rather than some rented thing from the tour company. The red, now that I was closer, definitely looked like dried blood. No other signs around, which was more concerning than anything else. Gulls, scavengers, they'd have been all over a mess this big. That's when I heard it. The sound of something moving in the trees, big and heavy. It was coming from uphill, 
deeper in toward the hammock. I called out, thinking it might be the unlucky canoeist after all, injured but nearby. What I got in response was a snort, raspy, almost like a hoarse cough, but with an undertone that made the skin on my arms crawl. Something about that sound wasn't animal, wasn't anything I'd ever heard before. Then the trees shifted, not a swaying with the wind kind of shift. This was a deliberate movement, something massive pushing its way through, unconcerned with the noise. I caught a glimpse of yellow eyes gleaming in the dark, eyes that weren't near ground level, not unless whatever they belonged to was standing on two legs. Every survival instinct I had screamed at me to get the hell out of there. I'm no fool, so I did. Ran back to the jeep like a chased rabbit, radio squawking for backup that wasn't going to arrive in time. Drove like a madman until I hit the station, burst through the door shouting about... Well, to be honest, I'm not sure what I was shouting about. Some of the old-timer rangers patted me down, figured I'd been spooked by a panther or a gator that got a little close for comfort. One of them, grizzled old fella named Walt, took me aside for a drink. He'd been in the service longer than I'd been alive and had eyes that saw right through a man's bullshit. He listened to my rambling without interrupting. When I was done, hiccuping in that shaky way that follows a scare, he didn't laugh or call me green. He just got real quiet and told me something I'll never forget. Boy, there's critters in this swamp been here since before we were, and there's things we learned not to mess with long ago. If you saw what you think you saw, best leave it be. This ain't a place for hunting monsters. Now I'm not prone to spooking, but Walt had a certain aura. You don't last out here his length of time if you're soft. Something in his tone in the way his eyes got real distant, told me he wasn't just spinning some yarn to haze the newbie. I didn't quit the job after that. Pride mostly, and because, well, a man's gotta work. But I started carrying heavier weaponry on patrols, more than your average ranger, and avoided solo night shifts whenever I could. The thing is, you start hearing whispers after a while. Stories about other disappearances, hikers who never returned, Fishermen whose boats washed up empty, even whole families who vanished without a trace. No bodies, no evidence, just gone. And always, just outside the corner of your eye, a sense of being watched. Months later, I got a call on the radio. A frantic one. A couple of tourists, out on an airboat tour near Pahe Oki, swore they saw something huge and scaly pull itself from the water and disappear into the tree line. Sounded familiar, didn't it? I headed out there fast, a whole crew in tow. We searched the area, found some disturbed vegetation, and what might have been enormous footprints pressed into the muddy bank. Nothing that could definitively prove anything, but enough to send a chill down your spine. Now, the higher-ups didn't like it. Bad publicity spooks the visitors, so they put the official story down as a large alligator out of its range. They warned folks to be cautious. No one ever said the words of what we all were thinking, that something different was lurking out there. I stayed on for a few more years, mostly out of stubbornness, I suppose. I never saw the creature again, not clearly, but I felt it, out there in the shadows. The sense of something ancient, powerful, that saw us less as a threat and more like ants to be stomped out under its massive heel. Eventually, I took a transfer inland. Still work in the wildlife service, mostly in education now. Keep an eye on the young pups coming through, the ones with that same glint of excitement I used to have. Sometimes late at night, I still dream of the Everglades, the rustling reeds, the yellow eyes burning in the darkness, and the certainty that one day... Whatever is out there might not be content just watching anymore. I hear old Walt's voice in those dreams, low and ragged. Best leave it be, boy. Leave it be. Some folks believe there's a cryptid out there, an undiscovered species surviving in the swamp's heart. Others whisper darker things, 
folklore, stories passed down through generations about monsters with scales and teeth. They call it the skunk ape, thinking it's some half-formed cousin of Bigfoot. Me, I don't know what it is. All I know is, it's real, it's hungry, and one day, it might just decide we're on the menu. There's this odd comfort in the hum of fluorescent lights, a monotony I've come to appreciate in my line of work. I'm Hawthorne Quill, a researcher tucked away in the sprawling woodlands at a secret U.S. government facility near the rarely treaded woods of the Chekomegon Nicolet National Forest, where my team and I venture into realms of genetic wizardry. We're fringe scientists, broaching subjects that skirt the outermost edges of moral ambiguity. On an ordinary day, interrupted only by measured sips of lukewarm coffee and routine lab checks, I came upon an anomaly. A sample, I'll call it Specimen K, had transformed overnight, displaying properties one might deem otherworldly. Its cells danced under my microscope like fireflies caught in a moonless night. With the adrenaline rush of potential discovery pumping through my veins, I failed to notice Mabel Trenchard, our security chief with an affinity for black licorice and bad jokes, peering over my shoulder. Looks like Kay's got better moves than you at the Christmas party, she quipped dryly, eyes locked on the screen. The gaiety lasted mere moments before an ear-splitting alarm cut through our lab's sterile sanctuary. From Specimen K to Code Red, we raced to pinpoint the emergency, a containment breach. My team scattered to secure their stations, Tensions ran high as protocol dictated immediate and precise action. Outside, deep within those almost sacred woods, lurked our impending nightmare. We hadn't realized it then, but our experiments had awakened something sinister. Nature had birthed its own version of retribution. The breach wasn't just physical. It was a roar against our scientific hubris. A creature born not from lore, but our own doing. Its presence could be felt more than seen. Trees felled as if by an invisible force. Claw marks on bark like cryptic messages addressed to no one and everyone. Briggs Rhyolite, my closest colleague and sturdy in demeanor as his name suggests, was first to encounter the beast. The two had met somewhere on the periphery where man's dominion blurs into wilderness arrogance. I didn't even see it coming. Briggs recounted breathlessly over his walkie-talkie. Every instinct told me he was sparing details to avoid panic. Whatever monstrosity now hunted us was foresightful enough not to show its full hand. Most days were armed with pens more lethal than bullets. Today was different. Hesitantly clasping firearms we barely knew how to hold steady, we mentally prepared for confrontations we were never meant to have. Nightfall approached like an ominous curtain threatening to unveil horrors beneath its veil. Looming pines were silhouetted against a dusk that heralded uncertainty instead of reprieve from daylight's formality. Our aim has always been progress. I reminded myself silently while treading lightly on a carpet of pine needles that did little to muffle dread's somber orchestra playing within us all. An amateur radio enthusiast could have composed symphonies out of our haphazard communications. We spoke curtly, directives overshadowing fear, yet fear was unmistakably there between each syllable we uttered. Then came a sudden crackle over the radio. Static. Silence. Then Avalie Spaulding's voice imploring aid in hushed tones betrayed only by underlying urgency. Quill. North Service Entrance. Come. She cut off prematurely. Another struggle against the unknown? I jog about towards my doomed rendezvous when fresh sounds assaulted my senses. A cacophony of destruction unlike any beast known to roam these woods freely before this twilight of terror. Bloody hell, interjected Milton DeRay, our IT whiz harrowingly out of his depth as he stumbled into view a flesh cut upon his pale cheekbone narrating untold tales of narrow escapes. Before us lay ruins of what used to be solid structures, 
monstrous power epitomized through demolished concrete and twisted metal. A Goliath stalked among us eager for destruction with an appetite whetted by Shadow's embrace. We should call for backup, Milton proposed vehemently while scanning ravaged landscapes with wild-eyed realization that dusk concealed deadlier things than misdemeanors in Shadow's midst. I reached for my radio. Base. Quill here. Urgent. North service entrance. Send. A roar cut me off. Metal screeched and I dove aside as part of a wall hurtled towards me. Scrambling up, I saw it. Huge, hulking, covered in bristly dark fur. The creature's hands ended in claws. It turned a pair of red eyes towards us. Milton grabbed my arm. We need to go now. We ran, the creature's steps thudding close behind. In an act of desperate courage or folly, Milton swung open a door and shoved me inside. Clear windows revealed it still on our heels. Hide, was all he said before he closed the door between us and that thing. My breath fogged the glass as I watched him distracted away from me, leading it on a deadly chase amidst the ruins of our station. There was no calling for help. Our radios lay crushed under debris and our cell phones had no signal due to the remote location. Alone with nothing but sheer instinct to rely on, I ducked through corridors unfamiliar from damage. Hours passed, or minutes. Time lost meaning as I moved, barely evading that disturbing presence. Eventually, silence fell, but I knew not why or how. After what felt like an eternity, dawn began to creep through broken walls. Only then did I allow myself to stop. Emerging into morning light's grasp, I found bodies, or what remained of them, torn apart by the creature's violent outburst. Amongst them lay Milton Doré, unrecognizable, except for his ID badge clinging to his shredded shirt. Police arrived as someone passing through had seen the aftermath at sunrise and called them. They listened with skepticism turned horror as we recounted events from those who survived. In those days that followed, we buried our dead, including Milton who had saved me at great cost to himself. When interviewed by curious officers, and even curiouser journalists, they assumed a bear must have broken in, driven mad by something we could not explain, an acceptable story for an unbelievable truth. They repaired the station, but it did not matter anymore. Something had changed within all of us who remained, an understanding without words that what occurred was beyond normal explanation. Through consoling embraces, for those we lost and nightmares too vivid to articulate, life strangely continued. But now, with an invisible divide between what we knew as reality and what lurked within it, an unseen boundary that sometimes thinned enough for horror to seep through its cracks. And somewhere beyond where we walked and lived, our mundane existences lurked a reminder, a monstrous power evident through demolished concrete and bent steel that there exist truths out in the fringe beyond day-to-day -day life just waiting to intrude upon us with ferocity unimaginable until witnessed firsthand. I woke up this morning with an uneasy feeling, something I couldn't quite put my finger on. My name is Clayton Aldridge, and I'm your average, everyday guy, except for the fact that I collect rare stamps. As I stepped outside my house in a small town in New Hampshire, I noticed the atmosphere was tense. A friend of mine, Emrick Dolezal, came running toward me with a troubled expression. Clayton, have you heard? Kara Trottier vanished last night. No one knows what happened. We had both known Kara for years. Her disappearance sent a chill down my spine. I decided to take a walk by the nearby woods to clear my head. Suddenly, something caught my attention, what appeared to be torn pieces of clothing on the ground. This was definitely out of the ordinary. I felt compelled to investigate further and cautiously ventured into the dense forest. The light from daybreak barely illuminated the path as I continued deeper into the woods. Then I stumbled upon something that made my heart drop 
an empty shoe covered in blood. Feeling uneasy but determined to get answers, I kept going until I reached an abandoned cabin tucked away among the trees. The door creaked open as if urging me inside. Once inside, I called out to see if anyone was there, but no response came back. Out of nowhere, Emmerich burst through the door, panting as he tried to catch his breath. Clayton, I heard strange noises from the woods and thought you might be in trouble. Nodding at him appreciatively for his concern, we pressed onward and stumbled upon a hidden room within the cabin. The sight before us was disturbing. Blood coated the walls and scraps of human flesh scattered across the floor. Horrified by what we saw, our instincts kicked in. We needed to escape immediately. As we turned to leave, a guttural growl emanated from behind us. Fear gripped our bodies as we faced the source of the unsettling sound. A humanoid wolf creature with massive claws and sharp teeth leered at us menacingly. Unlike anything I had ever seen before, it towered at least eight feet tall. The beast barred our exit, seemingly enjoying the terror it inflicted. Emmerich and I exchanged a quick glance, but didn't have time for discussion. We both sprinted back into the hidden room, hoping to find another way out. The creature let out a roar and charged after us with incredible speed and agility. Panicking, we desperately searched for a possible exit or weapon to defend ourselves. As our eyes scanned the room frantically, I noticed a rusted shotgun mounted on the wall that managed to evade my attention earlier. Quickly grabbing it, I loaded it with shells I found lying nearby. Emmerich shouted hurriedly, Through that door! There's an old root cellar! We barely had time to barricade ourselves inside before the creature rammed into the door with its powerful body. Realizing that we were trapped with no real means of escape made our voices shake as we spoke. What, what do we do now? Emmerich asked, drenched in cold sweat. I could feel anxiety tightening its grip on my chest as I replied quietly, I don't know, Emmerich, but whatever happens, this thing is not getting past us. The sound of splintering wood filled the air as the beast began breaking down the barrier between us. My hands trembled as I steadied the shotgun and braced myself for what was about to happen. I whispered a prayer inaudibly under my breath before stealing myself for battle. The creature tore through the debris separating us, revealing its menacing form in all its terrifying glory. The creature's sharp, elongated teeth seemed to gleam as it lunged toward us. Its fur-covered body was massive, and its eyes were a haunting shade of yellow that I had never seen before. Despite bearing resemblance to a wolf, this beast was something much more monstrous, with an air of intelligence that made it all the more frightening. Emmerich and I dodged its first swipe, and I fired the shotgun in its direction. The creature stumbled back but seemed unfazed by the blast. Can't we call someone for help? Emmerich cried out desperately as we continued evading its attacks. No signal down here. We're on our own, I shouted back, struggling to keep my composure amid the chaos. We continued our dance of death with the creature, it attacking relentlessly while we barely managed to escape each time. Several more shots rang out from the shotgun I wielded, but nothing seemed to slow down this terrible beast. As we fought for our lives, a biting sadness washed over me. I couldn't save my friend Sarah from this cruel fate. Her life had been claimed by the monster too quickly for me to react. I could feel her absence now as Emmerich and I fought side by side. In a split second when the creature was momentarily distracted by another shot, Emmerich saw an opportunity and seized it. He noticed a small gap in the cellar wall where some bricks had crumbled away, revealing a narrow passage just large enough for us to squeeze through. Over there! He shouted over the roar of the beast. Without hesitation, we made our break for it and crawled through the passage as fast as we could, praying that the creature wouldn't be able to follow us. The passageway was dark and cramped, but eventually led us to another door at the opposite end of the cellar. We burst through that door and found ourselves outside again in the moonlit night. Without even looking back, we ran as fast as we could, our fear spurring us on. After hours of running and hiding, 
we finally stopped by a small creek to catch our breaths. We had managed to escape the clutches of the creature, but I knew in my heart our ordeal was far from over. We need to tell people about this, Emmerich panted, trying to catch his breath. Nobody should ever have to go through what we just did. I agreed with him wholeheartedly, but couldn't shake the feeling that it would do little good. This creature seemed near unstoppable. What could anyone do against such a force? Emmerich and I made our way back to town and informed the local authorities about what had happened. Of course, without any evidence, few believed us. We were dismissed as liars or madmen, but I knew deep down that Sarah's death was not in vain. I needed to find answers about this creature, the truth of its existence, and how it could be stopped. As time passed, and we gathered information from various sources who claimed sightings of similar creatures throughout history, one word came up consistently. Werewolf. This legendary monster seemed to be the closest match to what Emmerich and I had encountered. Bound by our harrowing experience and shared loss, Emmerich and I continued searching for answers while trying our best not to get consumed by a growing obsession with the creature that haunted us. Though Sarah's life was taken too soon, her memory lived on in our drive for justice, hopefully preventing others from falling victim to this nightmarish predator lurking in dark corners of the world. With each passing day, as more questions went unanswered, I knew that this monstrous werewolf might remain an enigmatic predator, just as it had been for countless others who'd come before us. Even as hope dwindled in our hearts, that we'd ever truly defeat this nightmarish foe, we trudged on, undaunted in our hunt for the truth about the creature that had stolen so much from us. And every night when the moon shone down on us, I couldn't help but carry an underlying fear, wondering whether or not the werewolf would strike again. It all began when I, Thomas Abernathy, moved to a small town in Oregon named Briarwood. I needed a fresh start after a messy divorce and decided to open my shop fixing vintage electronics. Everyone in town was friendly and welcoming, but there was something off about the picturesque mountain community. One day, Abraham Pennington visited my shop. He asked if I could repair an antique radio he found in his grandmother's attic. This would usually be a routine task for me, but when I looked at the device, a sense of dread came over me. Over the next few days, strange things started happening. My tools would go missing or end up in bizarre places. Whispers were heard outside my window, and the mysterious markings on the radio seemed to grow clearer and more ominous each time I looked at them. Feeling uneasy, I went to see Abigail O'Donnell, a local historian with more knowledge about Briarwood than anyone else could remember. She invited me into her cramped study layered with historical artifacts from the town over generations. When I showed her the radio, Abigail turned pale and told me the dark history of Briarwood, how several hundred years ago, settlers reported terrifying animal attacks with no clear origin. Many members of their tight-knit community disappeared without a trace, only to be found dead later with inexplicable injuries. As we sat in her study discussing these ancient legends and unsolved mysteries, Abigail confessed that she believed these horrifying episodes stemmed from an unknown creature residing deep within the surrounding forests, something otherworldly yet undeniably intelligent. Together we delved into research about potential explanations for these disturbing occurrences while strange events continued to unfold around us. A week later, our suspicions were seemingly confirmed when Samuel Higgins stumbled into town covered in bizarre scratches that didn't match any known creature in the region. Amid fearful whispered speculation and growing panic among townspeople, I organized a search party with fellow residents Henry Rutherford and Simon Wellington to venture into the forest and find answers. As we trekked deeper, the environment seemed to distort with every step. Trees twisted unnaturally, branches appeared torn off as if by powerful claws, 
and indescribable tracks marked the muddy ground beneath our feet. All of us felt uneasy, but our determination to restore safety to Briarwood overpowered any doubts. That was until an ungodly screech echoed through the forest, sending chills down our spines. Simon insisted he saw something slither unnaturally around us and rushed off track with a knife in hand. Henry hesitated for a moment before sprinting after him, leaving me alone between the twisted trunks. Terrifying thoughts raced through my mind as I grappled with my fear and the growing realization of what we were facing. What is this horrendous creature haunting Briarwood? How can we hope to stop it without knowing its weaknesses? The sun dipped behind dark clouds as night drew closer, turning the oppressive atmosphere even more treacherous. Suddenly in the distance, I saw movement, a grotesque figure unlike anything on earth with sinister reptilian features crawling through the foliage. I called out desperately for Simon and Henry, my voice barely rising above the cacophony of the forest. They didn't respond. Terrified, I decided to make my way back towards the town, hoping to find them on the journey home. As I hurried through the increasingly mutilated environment, the creature followed closely behind. Though I couldn't see it clearly, I could feel its presence, sense its size and weight as it crushed branches under its massive form. Every time I turned around, hoping to catch a glimpse of it, all that remained were the broken remnants of nearby foliage smashed apart by the brutal impact of its movements. I continued my frantic escape from this nightmarish creature. It was clear fighting was not an option, not against this enormous beast, and looking for answers would only lead to a gruesome end. My only hope was to survive and warn others in Briarwood. A sudden rustling caught my attention. I held my breath and braced myself for what might emerge from the twisted underbrush. To my relief, Henry burst onto the path. He glanced around wildly, his face streaked with sweat and fear. Where's Simon? He gasped when he saw me standing there. Fear gripped me as I realized that the silence that engulfed Simon earlier signified a fatal outcome. Before I had a chance to reply or muster any sympathy for our lost friend, however, we heard a guttural growl erupting through the shadows behind us. It sounded far too close for comfort. We have to go, I urged Henry as we broke into a mad sprint, both of us unwilling to look back in case we became paralyzed with terror. What little light remained cast menacing shadows across our surroundings, making every leaf and gnarled root seem sinister. Beneath our feet, we could feel the earth shuddering with each monstrous step this creature took in pursuit. With every breathless stride, we kept our focus on the forest's edge. We just needed to reach the town and its people to have any chance of surviving. As we neared Briarwood, the creature's guttural growls grew louder and more vicious, like metal scraping against rock. It was unbearably gruesome echoing through my core and setting my heart racing. Suddenly, there was a commotion in the distance, dogs barking frantically accompanied by shouts of alarm. We called for help with renewed hope, finally reaching the edge of Briarwood, where our pleas were met with wide-eyed stares from bewildered townspeople. Seeing our desperate expressions and hearing our account of this reptilian beast stalking us through the woods confirmed their worst fears. Samuel Higgins's incident was only the beginning. As the events unfolded in Briarwood, it became a struggle for survival for all those who lived there. The villagers banded together to protect one another from this horrific creature that had emerged from deep within the forest. No one knew anything about this monstrous creature. Information on reptilian beings was scarce in our little town, let alone about something resembling an alien species. We didn't bother with folklore. No such answers could be found in ancient myth and legend for a creature so alien and terrifying. This enemy was altogether different. Though I bore witness to the beast's violent onslaught from a safe distance, and while I mourned Simon and others like him, whose lives were cut short, I vowed never to forget their memory. Drawing on this visceral experience and terrorized like never before, 
I dedicated myself to protecting others from suffering the same fate. Together with Henry and remaining townspeople who had survived these disastrous events, we transformed Briarwood into a fortified refuge where no monstrous entity would ever threaten us again. We fortified walls and established watch teams day and night to keep everyone safe. We were survivors determined not to forget those we had lost to this nightmarish creature that had inexplicably invaded our town. As time went on, we learned to live with the shadow this tragedy cast over us. Briarwood was forever changed. We held on to one simple truth. Survival was a hard-fought victory against an enemy that defied all logic and understanding. My name is Ellis Carver, and this happened to me on October 12, 2003, out in Olympic National Forest, Washington State. Been a ranger all my life, just like my dad and his dad before him. I know these woods like the back of my hand. Seen plenty of things tourists never will. Bears, bobcats, even the odd wolf passing through. Nothing ever truly dangerous, though. At least, not until that day. Now, this part of the forest is remote. We're talking no cell service, barely a signal for the radio. That's why my partner and I mostly stick together on patrol, especially if there's been a report of trouble. That morning was one such case. A group of campers hadn't made their scheduled check-in. Could be nothing, but it's our job to investigate. My partner's Dale Flynn, a good guy, bit of a jokester, but knows his stuff too. We hike in, following the trail to their last known campsite. Place is empty, tent still set up. No sign of a struggle, no trash left behind like a bear got into their things. Just gone. That's when we start getting a bad feeling. Dale suggests we split up, cover more ground. I don't like it, but he's right. We agree to stick within shouting distance and check in over the radio every 20 minutes. We head out, me going deeper into the trees, Dale circling wide towards the south. It's slow going, terrain full of brush and fallen logs. I'm calling out for the missing campers, half expecting them to wander out of the bushes, confused and hung over. An hour passes, and the hairs on the back of my neck start to prickle. Too quiet. No bird song, no squirrels rustling in the leaves. Even the wind seems to have died. And Dale. He hasn't answered a radio check in a while. I try again. Dale, come in Dale, over. Static crackles back. I break into a cold sweat. That sinking feeling in my gut intensifies. Something's wrong. I shout his name, my voice cracking in the unnatural silence. Nothing. Then, I see it. A flash of movement up ahead through the trees. A figure, tall and hunched over. At first, I think it's just Dale. I move closer, calling his name again. But as the figure steps into a patch of sunlight, I freeze. This ain't Dale. It ain't even human. The thing is massive, at least seven feet tall, covered in thick, dark fur, arms so long they almost drag on the ground. But it's the face that haunts me, like a man, but twisted, huge jaw jutting out, filled with yellow teeth. The eyes, small, black, glinting in the dim light, intelligent. It notices me, lets out a low growl that rattles my bones. I try for my radio, but my fingers fumble. The thing lunges, moving with impossible speed for something its size. I trip, scramble backwards on the damp earth. I see a flash of claws, and then pain. White hot, searing pain across my chest. It roars, a sound that's both animal and something far, far worse. I try to scream, but all that comes out are choked gurgles. The creature looms over me, reeking of rotten meat. It raises a massive paw, the claws glistening in the half-light. My time is up. I close my eyes, bracing for the end. And then... Gunshot. The report echoes through the trees and the creature jerks back with a snarl. 
I open my eyes. There's Dale, standing a dozen feet away, rifle raised. Another shot rings out, hitting the creature in the shoulder. It roars in fury, then turns and bolts into the undergrowth, disappearing with shocking agility. Dale rushes over, dropping to his knees beside me. I try to speak, but blood bubbles from my mouth. He shakes his head, face pale. Ambulance is on the way, Ellis. Just hang on, he says, but I know we both hear the lie. I look up at the canopy of trees overhead, dappled sunlight filtering through. Such a beautiful place to die. I feel a wave of darkness wash over me, and my vision starts to fade. Dale's voice sounds far away now. Then faintly, I hear it. A rustling in the bushes, branches snapping, the patter of heavy footsteps closing in. Dale doesn't seem to hear it at first. His eyes are focused on me, pleading. But then his head whips around, and his expression shifts to horror. Ellis! Close your eyes! Don't look! He yells. There's a tremor in his voice, the kind I've never heard from him. I don't have the strength to obey, but I hardly need to. The creature bursts out of the undergrowth, a blur of fury. It doesn't go for me, though. Dale fires his rifle again, a desperate shot that goes wide as the creature barrels into him. They hit the ground with a sickening thud, Dale's scream cutting short. It's a blur of fur and teeth and blood. Dale thrashes, manages to throw a punch, but it's like a mosquito against a buffalo. The creature raises him off the ground one-handed, then slams him against a tree. There's the sound of bone snapping, and Dale goes limp, eyes wide and staring at nothing. Pure animal instinct kicks in then. No thought. Just move. I push myself up, the pain in my chest beyond description. The creature is occupied, ripping and tearing at Dale's lifeless body. I stumble a couple of steps, reaching for my pistol where it fell. Then I'm falling. My legs give out. I hit the damp ground, and that's when I see it. A thick branch, ripped from a sapling. It's long, sharp at the broken end. A weapon, if I'm desperate enough. The creature turns, a snarl curling its lips back from those bloody teeth. It sees me, registers that I'm still a threat. Or maybe it just wants more. I know I have seconds, maybe less. It charges. A terrifying sight, but I'm not helpless anymore. With an agonized grunt, I push myself onto one knee, raising the broken branch like a spear. The creature's almost on me, the stench of it overpowering, its monstrous eyes filled with single-minded hunger. Then, it impales itself on the branch. The momentum carries it forward, the sharp point ripping through its chest and out its back with a wet, tearing sound. Its roar morphs into a surprised gurgle. I fall back again, the effort nearly bringing me unconscious. The creature thrashes against the branch, but it's a mortal wound. It collapses next to me, twitching and choking on its own blood. Then it lies still. Its small, dark eyes stare blankly at the sky. I did it. I don't know how, but I did it. But then, from deeper in the trees, there's another sound a long, mournful howl, answering the first roar, and then another, closer, and another, too many to count. Panic floods me anew. Dale's wrong. I'm not going to make it. Blackness threatens to consume me. I fight it, scrambling, crawling, dragging myself along the forest floor. My breaths are ragged, my cries for help barely whispers. I have no idea where I'm going, just the instinct to get away, to put distance between myself and the monsters that will soon be here. The pain fades in and out. I feel the cold earth beneath my fingers, smell the rich scent of decaying leaves. Then I see it, a flicker of light up ahead. The forest opens up, and there, a road. It's small, more of a gravel track than a proper road, but salvation just the same. I crawl towards it, fueled by sheer, desperate hope. I collapse at the edge of the gravel, and I don't have the energy to do more. Everything is dim, vision blurring again. Then, headlights. A car is coming, 
jolting along the uneven path. I try to shout, to wave, but all I can manage is a feeble croak. The car stops, doors slam, and there are voices, concerned voices, asking if I'm hurt. My blood-soaked ranger uniform is answer enough. Someone calls for help, a voice trembling on a cell phone. It's going to be all right, they say. Help is on the way. I want to believe them, but I also hear the rustle of leaves in the forest, the snapping of twigs. They're coming closer. The headlights illuminate the tree line, casting long, sinister shadows. I try to tell them to get back in the car, to run. My mouth works, but nothing comes out. A dark shape emerges from the woods, then another, and another. Small eyes glint back at me in the harsh glare of the headlights. The people with me gasp in fear. One of them starts to scream. I close my eyes. I don't want to see what happens next. I wake up in a hospital bed. Clean sheets, the smell of disinfectant. My head is pounding and my chest feels like it's on fire. But I'm alive. Alive, but not alone. Janice, my friend from the ranger station, sits by my bed. There are dark circles under her eyes. She forces a smile, but it trembles as she reaches for my hand. They found you on the side of the road, she says, her voice thick. A couple of hikers. You were barely conscious. Dale... Dale didn't make it, Ellis. The news hits me like a physical blow. Grief and guilt wash over me in a numbing wave. She talks about the rescue team that went in, about how they found Dale's body and what was left of the creature I killed. There are more questions, so many questions. What was it? How many are there? Why? The doctors and the police come, asking me to recount everything. I do, mechanically, not believing my own words. They nod, jot things down. They reassure me that the area is closed off, that they're investigating. But there's a glint in their eyes, a skepticism. I know what they're thinking, Trauma victim, making up a wild story to cover what really happened to his partner. I'm released from the hospital a week later. There's a small memorial service for Dale. Afterwards I go back to my cabin, the one I was living in before all this. I should feel safe there, but I don't. The trees stare at me accusingly through the windows. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of the wind is a potential monster lurking at the edge of my awareness. I try to get back to work, to routine, but it's impossible. The rangers look at me with pity, like I'm a ticking time bomb. They whisper when I'm not around. Out in the woods, every shadow, every snap of a twig sends a jolt of terror through me. I jump at every sound, gun always in hand, sleep an impossible luxury. The nightmares come. Vivid, horrifying dreams of the creature, of Dale's death. They replay over and over, a torture without end. I start to drink. It's the only way to dull the pain, to stop the relentless churn of fear and guilt in my gut. They let me go, of course. Say it's best for all concerned. I don't fight it. I barely acknowledge it. Life fragments. I drift from town to town, taking odd jobs, never staying anywhere too long. The bottle is my constant companion. The only faces I trust are at the bottom of a glass, and all the while I hear them. The rustle in the bushes, the low growl from the shadows, the echoing howls in the dead of night. I know they're out there, lurking in the wild places, waiting, watching, and part of me waits too. For the day the bottle isn't enough, the day I finally meet one of those creatures again, and the nightmare ends for good. This happened to me on September 15th, 2011. My name's Doug, Doug Kendrick, search and rescue in Mount Rainier National Park. It's my patch, been out here longer than I care to admit. Guess that makes me part of the scenery now like the moss and old-growth trees. Used to love getting lost in the quiet out here. Things change. Today, it's radio check-ins and reports on unauthorized campfire rings. Routine stuff. 
suns peeking through the dense canopy as I hike, that fresh, earthy smell in the air. Then I see something that puts me on edge. It's a pile of rocks carefully stacked into a cairn. Thing is, it's nowhere near a trail. Somebody's been out here marking something, but why? I move on, boots crunching on fallen leaves. The forest seems to close in, shadows long and still. I find myself checking my back more than usual. There's a flicker of movement up ahead and I freeze. It's just a deer, big doe, staring at me before crashing off into the undergrowth. I let out a shaky breath and keep pushing. A few minutes later, another cairn. This one's bigger, the stones stained with something dark. I get close enough to make out the stench, blood, old and dried. That's when I find the body. It isn't human, at least not anymore. It looks like a deer, but twisted and mangled, limbs broken at wrong angles. The eyes are gone, pecked out by birds. This isn't a cougar kill. Whatever did this was deliberate, almost artistic in its brutality. I radio it in. My voice sounds thin, even to me. The dispatcher tells me to stay put. Reinforcements arrive in record time. There are five of us, all seasoned rangers, armed with rifles. This isn't our standard protocol, but none of us are arguing. We fan out, searching for any tracks or signs of struggle. We find the trail of the thing that dragged the deer carcass. The drag marks are deep in the soft ground. Whatever made them was big and strong. We follow the trail until it peters out at the base of a cliff. Looks freshly disturbed, rocks tumbled, a few thin, scraggly pines uprooted. One of the rangers, Walker, is the first to speak. Let's head back. We're not equipped for whatever left those marks. None of us object. We report a possible dangerous animal situation and head back to base. We don't talk about the cairns. Maybe we're afraid to put words to the unsettling feeling that's begun to gnaw at us. The next day... I'm back on the same trail. Dispatch says there's been a report of a missing hiker. They want me to do a solo sweep. I swallow my objections. I'm their best tracker, after all. It's been a while since I've been this deep without backup. The forest feels different, almost. Alive. And not in a good way. I come across another cairn, just like the others, with that same dark stain on the rocks. Then I spot the glint of something in the leaves. It's the missing hiker's watch. Panic tightens in my chest. I'm about to radio it in when I sense something behind me. I whirl around, rifle raised, and see nothing. But the hair on the back of my neck is standing on end. I know I'm being watched. Something moves in the branches above. It's huge, a silhouette against the dappled light. But I catch a flash of something. Wrong. Antlers. Too long and crooked, and eyes that glint like hot coals. It drops from the tree with horrifying speed. I get one shot off. The thing roars, a sound so raw it strips the leaves from the branches around us. I see teeth, a long, dripping muzzle. Then it's on me. I fight back, but it's too strong, knocking the rifle from my hands. Claws tear at my flesh. I'm vaguely aware of screaming. It might even be me, but mostly there's the overwhelming stench of rot and blood and those burning eyes. Then, it's gone, vanished into the trees like a phantom. I lie there, bleeding and barely conscious. I'm going to die out here, like that mangled deer. I can't get the image of its eyes out of my head. The last thing I hear before I pass out is the sound of snapping twigs moving closer. When I wake, I'm in a hospital bed. Turns out backup found me just in time, or at least what was left of me. Took months to put me back together. The official story is a bear attack, and okay, I can't prove it was something else, but I know. Never went back to being a ranger after that. Desk duty suits me fine. People don't understand. It isn't the fear of dying that gets you. It's the way you know, deep down, that the creature, it enjoys it. I still dream of those eyes and the feeling of being hunted. Now, 
It isn't the forest that calls to me, but the safety of four walls and city lights. Locals here, they have names for it. The Wendigo. The Forest Devil. I don't know what it is or where it came from. What I do know is it's still out there. And sometimes on nights when the wind whispers through the streets, I swear I smell the damp earth and blood, and I know it's waiting. They transferred me to a different park, far from here. City place, paved paths and trimmed lawns. Should feel safe, but it doesn't. The concrete and crowds, they just make me feel more trapped. At night, I see the alleyways, the fire escapes, all those slivers of darkness, and I wonder if it can find me here. My apartment's got thick curtains on the windows and I double-check the locks every night. Can't explain why, not really. Sometimes I still catch the scent of pine needles and wet earth on the breeze and wonder if that's just the city fumes playing tricks or if the forest has followed me here. When I lie awake, staring up at the ceiling, I swear those aren't just shadows playing tricks with my eyes. I see them, you know? The antlers, the eyes like embers. The doctors. They gave me a diagnosis, some fancy letters for stress and trauma. Said the pills will help. They haven't. Not really. Because deep down, I know those eyes don't belong to any nightmare. They're real. They're out there. You don't survive something like that and come out unchanged. A few years back, it feels like a lifetime ago now, some college buddies and I decided to take a road trip down to the Everglades. See, I didn't know much about the place back then. Some swamp with gators and creepy crawlies, right? Didn't seem like my usual scene, but hey, it beat sitting in class or flipping burgers like I normally did to pass the time. My name's Taryn, by the way. So, there we were, four of us crammed into a beat-up old SUV with just enough gear for a long weekend of camping. The plan was to hike the Loop Road, a remote trail cutting through the heart of Big Cypress National Preserve. The drive from Miami was long and muggy the road dwindling into barely maintained gravel. There wasn't much to see, just miles and miles of sawgrass and mangroves as far as the eye could see. Even the guys, usually so loud and full of jokes, fell silent as the landscape grew more desolate. Finally, we reached the trailhead. It was late afternoon, and the ranger on duty, a wiry, sunburned old guy, didn't look too pleased to see us. He warned us about staying on the path, watching for snakes, and all the usual precautions. Then he threw in the kicker. There had been sightings of a panther in the area recently, and the park was closing trails at six sharp each evening. With that cheerful piece of news, he sent us on our way. The first part of the hike wasn't so bad. The trail was clear, and the swamp had a kind of strange beauty especially with the late afternoon sun slanting through the cypress trees. There were birds everywhere, big heron-looking things stalking through the shallows, and flocks of smaller birds wheeling and chattering in the air. And, of course, the bugs. I swear the mosquitoes down there were the size of hummingbirds. As dusk started creeping in, things took a turn. The chirping and buzzing faded away, replaced by an eerie silence broken only by the rustle of leaves and the occasional splash from the depths of the swamp. Shadows stretched and shifted, making it harder to see the trail. I'll admit, my imagination started getting the better of me. Half expected to see red eyes gleaming out of the darkness, following our every move. Then we stumbled across it. Just off the trail, half hidden in the undergrowth, lay what looked like a deer carcass or what was left of one, anyhow. The bones were picked clean, and the thing stank to high heaven. My buddy Vance made some remark about buzzards being efficient, but the whole thing left me a little queasy. Deciding we'd had enough excitement for the day, we found a clearing and set up camp for the night. After a quick dinner cooked over the campfire, 
we turned in, hoping to get some rest before pushing on the next day. Sleep didn't come easy, though. Every creak, every rustle of leaves outside the tent had me wide awake and on edge. Around what must have been the middle of the night, it happened. I woke up with a jolt, sweat beating on my brow. At first I couldn't figure out what had roused me, but then I heard it. A scratching noise, coming from right outside the tent. My heart pounded in my chest, and I lay there frozen, hardly daring to breathe. There it was again, louder this time, like something was dragging its claws along the nylon of the tent. I reached for Vance, gave him a shake. His eyes flew open, and I mouthed the words, Something's out there. His face went pale, the bravado he usually carried with him completely gone. He fumbled with the flashlight, sending shaky beams of light across the inside of the tent. I don't know what I expected to see, but it definitely wasn't what appeared as Vance lifted the tent flap. Towering over us was the most grotesque creature I've ever witnessed. It looked vaguely humanoid but all wrong. Its skin had the texture of old tree bark, knobby and coarse, and draped over a frame that was too long and too lean. Where the face should have been, there was nothing but a smooth, featureless expanse of that same bark-like skin. For a moment, we were locked in a frozen tableau, us wide-eyed with terror, and that… thing, tilting its head with an almost chilling curiosity. Then, as if deciding we weren't interesting enough, it turned and melted away into the shadows. There was no discussion, no plan. We threw ourselves out of the tent, barely pausing to grab our packs before sprinting down the trail in the opposite direction. Branches whipped my face. Thorns tore my skin, but I didn't slow down. Behind us, the creature gave chase, its long strides making a mockery of our frantic efforts. Vance stumbled and fell, a cry escaping his lips as he twisted his ankle. I was about to haul him up when the creature loomed out of the darkness. It snatched him into the air, his screams choked off abruptly. Blind panic took over. I ran, not knowing where just running until my legs burned and my lungs screamed for mercy. Eventually I tripped over an exposed root and crashed to the mossy ground. I lay there, sobbing for breath, waiting for the creature to reappear, to finish what it had started. Surprisingly, it didn't. I waited for what felt like hours, the swamp sounds gradually returning to fill the silence left by my pursuer. Somehow, I have no clue how. I found my way back to the trailhead just as dawn was breaking. The ranger was there, opening the gate for the day visitors. The look on his face when he saw my tattered clothes and tear-streaked face told me I didn't look like your average hiker. I babbled out some story about getting separated from my group and attacked by an animal. He wasn't buying it, but I couldn't bring myself to tell the truth. Who would? The rangers searched the area, found no sign of Vance, no evidence of my story. It was labeled an accident, another unprepared tourist claimed by the wilds. And me? I left Florida that same day and never returned. College went on hold. The old life felt meaningless. They say the Everglades are full of dangerous things. Turns out, the most dangerous ones are the ones that can walk on two legs and hide in plain sight. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I wake in a cold sweat and see that blank, bark-covered face. Hear the snap of branches, the rustle of dead leaves on the dry ground just outside my window. People talk about Seminole legends, old myths about a creature of the swamp. They call it the skunk ape, the stick man, or by a dozen other names. They spin those tales by campfires to scare themselves silly. Now. I'm not usually one for campfire tales, but maybe those old stories are more than just stories after all. Every now and then, life throws you a curveball that brings all your workaday complaints into stark relief. Mine came on what started as an ordinary Tuesday 
without any indication of the nightmare about to unfold. Standing in the chill of a secluded, government-run facility buried deep in the heart of the Alaskan wilderness, I, Kerwin Paddock, realized how the scientific curiosity I served could warp into something grotesque. My role? A specialist involved in genetic experiments that were ethereal whispers outside these fortified walls. The early hours at the lab were always shrouded in a monotonous tranquility reflected in our meticulous routine, broken only by the occasional flicker of humor to warm up our sterile environment. You think these genes make my petri dishes look big? My colleague Zephyr Judd quipped as he held up a slab of gelled specimens to the light. Our chuckles evaporated when we stumbled on our first anomaly. A sample had reacted unpredictably, and what was meant to be a controlled mutation had spiraled into an aggressive cellular freak show. Disgust and fascination tangled within me as I examined the rapidly expanding biomatter. Dusk purred softly around us as we prepped for a containment exercise. Weapons ready just in case our creation proved more than just repulsively vigorous on a cellular level. Outside the secured windows, something stirred amidst the dense fog that hugged the fir trees, a figure moving with unnatural grace. The setting sun, its final light ebbing, illuminated what seemed like elongated limbs and distorted features, like something dredged up from Algonquian folklore. We hadn't intended to craft flesh from legends. Still, there it was, disfiguring reality with its presence. In disbelief, I edged closer to identify it. The creature's silhouette demanded explanation, yet defied every try at rational thought. My heart hammered against my chest, not with fear, but with an intense scientist's curiosity, straining against common sense. I think we ought to call this one in whispered Zephyr from behind me. But who would we call? The higher-ups who sanctioned these experiments? The same people who'd squash us like bugs if we caused a panic? We opted for silence and observation, two men gripped by the gravity of what skulked beyond our human understanding. Our reticence hinged on self-preservation as much as it danced with incredulity. The beast ambled closer still. Its arrival wasn't fired by hunger or wrath, but a mortal purpose resonating in its stride. Phones dead in hand, men immobile with dread. The isolation didn't help. The faint echo of mockery rang through our minds. You don't bring mace to fend off Mother Nature's misfits, Zephyr's voice played back to me. A joke turned prophecy. Through foliage breaking under heavy steps, it presented itself as no timid partaker but an aggressive participant in our world. A biological tyranny birthed by hands which trembled at their own might now. And yet, despite everything logic dictated about fight or flight, or even containment, there we stood. Observers frozen at this intersection of man-made abomination and antiquated fear. It was hard to believe that mere hours ago, my biggest worry was overcooked eggs served at breakfast. Now armed with more than just spatulas and frying pans, we faced an entity undefined by science but recognized by ancestral nightmares. The surreal morphed tangible with every thudding pulse that reached my ears, a tempo mirroring our escalating situation. With no communication possible and nightfall's thickening shadow our only companion, an unspoken agreement passed between us. No retreat could be entertained while this entity prowled on American soil where it didn't belong, where it never should have existed. An ill-timed step back crunched a stray branch underfoot, alerting it as though drawn by erratic human hearts. It turned its ghastly countenance towards us. Kerwin, now might be... Zephyr's words cut short by necessity. Time froze. Zephyr's voice trailed off as the creature shifted its gaze. It stood on hind legs, matted fur covering its towering frame. Large ears sat atop its head, twitching at every sound. Its eyes, soulless orbs, locked onto our group. Kerwin stepped back slowly, his hands raised. We needed to move, 
but fear rooted us to the spot. The beast lunged. It tackled James first, who was closest. The rest of us scattered in blind panic. James's screams punctuated the night until they abruptly stopped. That silence was worse than his screams. I found a place to hide, a small crevice between rocks, where I stayed until my breathing slowed and I could hear beyond my own heartbeat. We had no weapons, nothing to fight back with. There was no plan. Our minds raced for survival alone. Is anyone there? Zephyr's voice came over the radio we each carried. I'm here, I whispered back, scared that any noise might draw attention. But we have to be quiet. One by one, others responded until we realized who didn't. James had fallen silent. There was no time to mourn or consider next moves. The beast hunted with purpose. It understood where it was and what it wanted. Us. We weren't equipped for this. Chefs and kitchen staff facing a predator unknown to any zoo or book. We weren't trained for this. We didn't know how to track it or anticipate its moves. It hunted us throughout the night, taking down Marie when she made a run for a nearby building. The sight too grisly to describe yet impossible to erase from memory. As dawn approached, none of us thought of calling for help. We had ventured deep into restricted woods for an annual team-building retreat where signals couldn't penetrate. We were alone. With first light, I finally mustered the courage to move again. The others agreed to regroup by what remained of our campsite, an unspoken understanding that now, separated from our assailant by daylight, it was our chance to escape back to civilization, to tell of what happened here. Survival consumed us. Discussing the beast felt like an attempt to give substance to a nightmare best left fleeting in detail. But once authorities questioned us, reality demanded that we try. We recounted tall hind legs allowing bipedal movement, fur so black it seemed part of the night itself, eyes adapted perfectly for hunting in darkness. Our descriptions painted a mix of wolf and bear, yet neither accurate nor full story of this hunter that became our prey. They searched for survivors or remains. They found neither James nor Marie, or traces of this predator we faced under unexpected circumstances. Now back at work, eggs cook on griddles, undisturbed by terror lurking in the forest shadows a fleeting peace marred occasionally by images of that night's horror, a push towards life's routine while acknowledging what might still roam free beyond where streetlights end and darkness begins, a reminder of both our fragility and strength when faced with inexplicable savagery, not meant for modern times but heeded nonetheless by several who will carry that burden silently among order sheets and dinner rushes each day henceforth. It was one of those afternoons where routine had taken hold, and I found myself walking the same path I always did in Central Park. My name is Nolan Thompson. I'm a sales manager and recently moved into the city for my job, the hustle and bustle of a city that never sleeps. I decided to take a break from my run and catch my breath on a nearby bench. Excuse me, said a man named Orville who seemed to appear out of nowhere. Have you seen my daughter? Her name is Lavinia, and she's been missing since this morning. He held up a picture of her, a petite girl with freckles, red hair, and green eyes. I shook my head as I caught my breath. Sorry, I managed to say, but if I see her, I'll let you know. We exchanged numbers, and Orville left with a somber expression on his face. As much as missing persons were becoming increasingly common these days, it was still jarring when it happened close to home. I continued on my run, reflecting on that short yet unnerving encounter when I noticed something unusual near an isolated area of the park. A large creature appeared between the trees. Its body resembled that of a wolf, but it stood upright like a human, with muscular arms and legs. The creature's head was akin to that of a wolf, but oddly elongated, with rows of sharp teeth. With stealthy movements, 
the creature dragged something behind it, something large and lifeless. As it came closer, my heart stopped. Its prey was not an animal. It was human. It paused momentarily as it sensed my presence. Time seemed to stand still as our eyes locked. It snarled at me, baring those monstrous teeth before lunging forward in an unnatural attempt to attack me before vanishing into the darkness around the park. I darted back towards the brighter areas, my legs burning in protest but alive with adrenaline that refused to let me stop. As I ran, it occurred to me that there was no way someone like me could take down a creature like that. I couldn't be sure this was the culprit responsible for Lavinia's disappearance, or even that of other missing persons. All I knew was that this nightmarish beast could kill, and it had an appetite for human flesh. There was no choice but to seek help. My phone buzzed furiously with a call from Orville. Any news? He asked, hopefully. There's something you need to know, I panted, trying to process what I had seen. We agreed to meet at the police station, unable to ignore the feeling of dread enveloping us. At the station, I recounted my experience in front of Orville and Officer Renwick. They exchanged glances filled with uncertainty. It sounds absurd, Renwick admitted, scratching his head. But we've received similar reports lately. A terrifying realization dawned on us all. Whatever this creature was, it wasn't just our imaginations. And it was dangerous. Nightfall came quickly as it did in winter months, and there was an urgency in the air to find Lavinia while we still had time. Orville insisted on joining us as Renwick recruited two more officers for our search, equipped with firearms if needed. Tactics were discussed and strategies formed for dealing with a humanoid wolf creature. Not exactly standard procedure, but we conceded that typical rules no longer applied here. Not knowing its full capabilities left us at a disadvantage, but would only help underestimating it become more deadly. Back in Central Park, my heart pounded against my ribs as we approached the area where I initially found the creature. Footsteps rustled through fallen leaves like a percussionist accompanying our descent into darkness. Then a scream echoed through the branches. It was distant and human. Orville recognized it in an instant, his daughter's voice prompting him to break into a mad sprint towards her. Our group followed, firearms at the ready, but what we soon discovered left our search party frozen in place. Lavinia, barely conscious, was sprawled on the ground with claw marks across her chest. The creature had maimed her while still managing to keep her alive. I yelled for Orville to call an ambulance while I examined Lavinia's wounds, trying my best not to cause her any more pain. Orville dialed frantically while Renwick and the other officers stood guard around us, guns aimed at the surrounding darkness. We knew the creature was still out there watching us, but we couldn't just leave Lavinia there, defenseless and in pain. As the ambulance sirens grew louder, I instructed everyone to remain silent so we could hear any signs of the creature approaching before it got too close. The paramedics arrived shortly after and began treating Lavinia's injuries while we updated them on the situation. They loaded her onto a stretcher, preparing to transport her to the hospital as quickly as possible. We could hear her cries of pain as they tried to stabilize her condition. It was a stark reminder of what we were up against. The officers and I decided that staying in one place wasn't an option. We needed to buy some time for Lavinia's safe extraction from the park. We split into two groups, one going east and the other heading west, hoping that whichever way the creature followed would give Lavinia that crucial window of opportunity she desperately needed. It soon became apparent that our plan had worked. We heard gunshots ringing out from the other group, indicating they had encountered the beast and were diverting its attention away from Lavinia and the paramedics. Adrenaline coursed through our veins as we dashed back towards them, knowing full well that our fellow officers could be ripped apart just like Lavinia if we didn't get there in time. As we reconnected with our colleagues, one of them had a gash down his arm where the creature had managed to swipe at him, but thankfully hadn't caused more severe injuries. 
Renwick bandaged up his wound while we all scanned the area, wary of the creature's next move. It had seemingly disappeared once again, slipping back into the darkness to torment us. Our search continued, and we soon stumbled upon the creature's lair, a cave hidden amongst the trees and foliage in a part of the park that had been left undisturbed for years. The heavy scent of animal musk emanated from within. There was no question that this was where it had been living, and we couldn't risk it harming anyone else. We entered cautiously, guns at the ready, prepared for an ambush. But we didn't find it inside. Instead, we discovered remains. Twisted body parts tore apart with savagery and brutality, barely recognizable as human anymore. It was a harrowing sight that sent a chill down our spines as all our worst fears were confirmed. It wasn't much longer before we heard news that Lavinia had been transferred safely to the hospital. However, the wound infection had worsened, which demanded for surgery almost immediately. Emboldened by her survival, we regrouped and discussed our next course of action. This was no ordinary threat. It was a killer with unnatural strength that wouldn't hesitate to take more lives if given the opportunity. We decided to enlist help from experts in tracking down predators, wildlife rangers accustomed to hunting large animals like bears or mountain lions. Together with their tracking skills and our firearms, we hope to locate and capture or eliminate this abomination now loose in Central Park. As we resumed our search, I stared at the bushes rustling ahead witnessing a furred figure dash back into hiding. I shouted out a warning to others. There it is. As everyone aimed their guns in the direction I pointed out, time seemed to stand still just right before another gruesome encounter finally ensued. I'm James Merrick, a regular guy with a passion for mountain biking. I recently moved from my job as an accountant to start a new life in Placerville, California. The main attraction was access to the scenic rural trails famous among cyclists like me. One Sunday morning, I remember that day clearly, I met up with Elwyn Bowden and Simeon Machado, two buddies who shared my love for the trails. We began our ride early enjoying the crisp air and the natural beauty surrounding us. As we biked deeper into the forest, Simeon related tales of how his father almost lost his leg in a car accident. Elwyn recounted the hilarious story when he mistakenly attended the wrong funeral, only to make a speech to strangers. Our laughter echoed in the trees. Alongside a nearby river, we decided to take a break and admire the clear water. As we caught our breaths, Simeon noticed something by the riverbank that seemed out of place. A bicycle tangled in some bushes caught our attention. Its wheels faced skyward and rusted spokes tangled together. We approached it cautiously and noticed streaks of blood on the ground. It was clear someone had been injured there recently. No one appeared to be around, so we chose to call local law enforcement using Elwyn's satellite phone. After reporting what we discovered, we ventured onto higher ground on foot to wait for their arrival. As minutes turned into hours, unease stirred within us. We shared stories to pass time, but couldn't shake off this oppressive air hovering around us. Just when darkness began to fall, we spotted movement near our bikes, an unidentifiable creature emerging from the shadows. It had scales covering its body and slitted yellow eyes that grew more menacing as it crept cautiously toward our belongings. Although a strange fear crept down my spine as it approached closer, I couldn't help but to examine its form. Four fingers and a thumb on both hands were clenched in an unsettling manner, displaying lengthy claws that could easily rip through flesh. Its legs resembled those of a reptile, and long, leathery tail dragging behind it. We stared at each other momentarily, unsure of how to react. It seemed to be assessing us, just as much as we were assessing it. Simultaneously, I found humor in the situation, saying to my buddies, You know, guys, I think we bit off more than we can chew with this adventure. Simeon murmured his agreement, 
but couldn't seem to get past his shock and fear, while Elwyn tried to remain calm by cracking another joke. Well, if we knew this would happen today, we probably would have stayed home. As our group faced the creature, its attention remained drawn to something in the shadows, just out of view from our position. A barely audible noise interrupted the silence and caught everyone's attention, including the creature's. My blood turned cold as a creeping terror seized my heart. Electing not to wait around any longer for the police to show up or figure out what's going on with this alienish monstrosity, Elwyn announced that we should head back into town immediately. You're right, I agreed, my voice barely steady as the strange beast seemed to focus on some growing commotion from within the woods. Simeon readily concurred with a hasty nod. Just as we decided to rush down the path back into town while leaving our bikes behind, shots rang out echoing into the night air. Dread increasingly washing over me like icy water, I saw human silhouettes entering the clearing where horrible stuff was going down. Ignoring their protests and demands for us to stop, or they would shoot us down too, I forced my legs onward simultaneously, pushing away thoughts of what had just happened. Fear propelled me forward, my friends following as the creatures closing in from behind. We sprinted back toward town, our breaths coming out in short, heavy gasps. The silhouettes behind us transformed into uniformed officers, desperately trying to gain control over the reptilian creature that had now revealed itself from the shadows. We could hear their shouts and panicked orders as bullets rained onto the beast. We kept on running not wanting to look back or think about what was happening. All we knew was we needed to get away. As we entered the town's perimeter, a sense of safety helped me catch my breath. What do you think that thing was? Simeon asked, his voice shaken. Do you think it's some sort of experiment? Elwyn speculated, breathing heavily. I shook my head. I don't know, but we need help. We should find someone who can handle this. Maybe the military or some government agency. We cautiously made our way toward the police station while keeping an eye out for any signs of danger or disorder in the town. When we reached the station, I nervously stepped inside and approached the officer at the front desk, relaying our encounter as best as I could without succumbing to fear. His eyes widened as he took in our disheveled appearances and serious expressions. He quickly made a phone call, updating his superiors about the situation and requesting immediate aid. As we waited for backup to arrive, people within the station whispered among themselves about the creature and theorized its origin, though no conclusion could be reached. Not long after, a tactical team arrived. Armed soldiers streamed into town as they secured areas surrounding where we had first encountered the reptilian monstrosity. The officers escorted us to a temporary command center set up near the scene where experts questioned us in great detail about our experience. After answering numerous questions that delved into every aspect imaginable related to our encounter with the creature, we were finally allowed to leave. As we walked home, feeling exhausted and numb, I couldn't help but glance at the dark woods where everything had started. I knew that Given how little we knew about the creature's existence and motives, this night would undoubtedly haunt us for a long time to come. A few days later, we were informed that the reptilian beast had been subdued and captured. It was transported to an undisclosed location for further study. The officers refused to divulge any more information, leaving us once again feeling uncertain and unsettled. Rumors around town began to circulate with wild speculation about the creature's origins. Was it the result of a military experiment gone wrong or something much more otherworldly? Simeon, Elwyn, and I found ourselves wanting answers but knowing that we would receive none. I thought about those who lost their lives that night in the woods, the officers who had tried to control the violent creature as it terrorized our sleepy town. They had faced unimaginable dangers out of a sense of duty and their heroics would not be forgotten by me or my friends, as weeks slowly turned into months, which turned into years. Finally, our once close-knit group began growing distant 
as each of us tried to move on with our lives and forget the terrifying memories of that night. But every so often, in a quiet moment when my thoughts would drift back to that horrifying encounter with the reptilian creature from the shadows, I couldn't help but wonder what else lay hidden out there in the dark woods beyond our small town, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to cross its path. This happened to me on August 2, 2012, up in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest in Washington. Back then, I was still a rookie, eager to prove myself out in the field. Names Everett, or Ev, to my search and rescue buddies. Grew up in the area, spent my life hiking and exploring these woods. Thought I knew them like the back of my hand. Turns out I knew Jack all about what really lurks out there in the shadows. We got called out to look for a pair of college students who got themselves turned around on the trails. They reported themselves as lost with a dwindling phone battery, but thankfully gave their last known location to dispatch. It should have been an easy afternoon's work. I set off with Harris, a grizzled veteran who'd mentored me when I first joined the service. Guy was built like a tank and never rattled, figured nothing could shake him. The trail wound through dense evergreen forest, towering trees blocking out the sun. We followed the students' route, calling out occasionally, but the woods swallowed up the sound. Cell service was non-existent that deep in, and after a couple of hours, my optimism was starting to fade. Even Harris started muttering under his breath, and that guy rattled less easily than a granite boulder. That's when we saw the first smear of blood. It was low on a moss-covered tree trunk, not much, but definitely fresh. Harris tensed up beside me, his grip tightening on his rifle. I felt a surge of unease and wished I hadn't insisted on bringing a pistol instead. Maybe growing up here made me a cocky, overconfident greenhorn. Then we found the backpack. One of the kids, shredded open with contents strewn across the ground. No sign of either student. My gut twisted. Cougars didn't do this. Bears didn't either. It was too messy, too deliberate. A low, chilling moan cut through the trees, echoing off the trunks. Harris and I froze mid-stride, exchanging a panicked glance. It was unlike any animal cry I'd ever heard, mournful and raspy, with an almost human quality to it. We were tracking something bigger and a whole lot more dangerous than lost hikers. Harris motioned toward the moan, raising an eyebrow. I gulped and nodded, trying to hide the tremor in my voice as I radioed for backup. As we pressed on, the undergrowth grew thicker, laced with spiky thorns. Those moans got louder, and something about the sound, it sent shivers down my spine. We found the first student a few minutes later, at least what was left of him. The scene turned my stomach, but Harris gripped my shoulder his voice tense. Look at the trees, rookie. And that's when I saw it. Perched on a branch high above was a figure so tall it seemed to merge with the shadows of the canopy. It was emaciated, all rib cage and sinewy limbs, skin clinging to protruding bones with an unnatural sickly pallor. Its head tilted in our direction and two eyes glinted down at us, glowing a malevolent yellow. But its face... That's what haunts my nightmares. Sunken cheeks, lips pulled back in a grotesque snarl, a jaw filled with too many teeth. It looked more corpse than creature. This was no bear or mountain lion. This was a monster born from the darkest corners of the human imagination. The thing snarled and leaped. It landed with a heavy thud, closer than I thought possible, and Harris swore. The creature stalked toward us, drool dripping from its bared teeth. It moved with a jerky, unnatural grace, like its bones barely fit within its skin. That's when the screaming started. The second student was hanging upside down in the branches above us, legs bound together with some kind of fibrous material. The creature tore into him with claws like jagged knives, its hunger a sickening thing to witness. We opened fire 
but it seemed barely phased. Harris yelled for me to run and took off in the opposite direction, drawing the creature's attention. I didn't look back, couldn't risk it. I was a runner, always had been. But fear puts wings on your heels, I swear. I sprinted through the trees, the creature's furious screeches chasing me, the ripping of flesh echoing behind. Somehow I found the path again, then the trailhead and my truck. Called for backup, got the National Guard scrambled, the whole works. They never found Harris, and they never found any trace of that thing either. They put it down to a rogue animal attack, said Harris must have gotten separated and cornered. Sometimes the official story's a necessary lie to keep the public calm. But deep down, I know that wasn't an animal. It was something far worse. I've seen things, out on patrols in the deep woods. Things that don't fit right. Once, I found a deer skeleton picked so clean it looked polished. Every inch of flesh stripped away. But nothing bigger than a coyote preys that way. Some whispers out there in the woods talk about an old legend, a spirit the local tribes call the Wendigo, a creature of insatiable hunger that mimics voices to lure victims, consumes them body and soul. Maybe that's what it was, maybe it wasn't. I don't know for sure. But I transferred to another district a few months later, closer to town, less remote forest. Figure there's safety in numbers, and I'm damn well sleeping better at night. Either way, I've always packed extra ammo ever since, and I ain't ever going back into those woods without a shotgun and a platoon at my back. Years back, before the swamp took a piece of me, I was a hotshot biologist with the National Park Service. Got posted to Big Cypress, figured I'd do some field work, collect data, maybe wrangle a few gators. Turns out, the Everglades had other plans. My name's Rowan. See, the thing about a swamp is, it gets under your skin. Not just the mosquitoes and the stink of stagnant water. It's something deeper. The sheer age of the place pressing down on you. Out there, you're not top of the food chain anymore. You're just another critter trying to survive. That Tuesday started normal enough. I was knee-deep in the mangroves, tracking a population of endangered wood storks. It's tough work. Mangroves tangle like barbed wire, and in the summer heat, the air practically curdles in your lungs. I was about to call it quits, chalk it up as another bust, when I spotted something. At first, I thought it was a gator carcass that had washed up. Happens in storms sometimes, big reptiles getting tossed around like toys. But this, this was different. The body was too far up the bank, and it wasn't bloated the right way. Curiosity, the bane of any biologist, got the better of me. I slogged through the muck, swatting away flies the size of quarters. That's when I got a good look at it. The thing, it had been human once. Now, the flesh hung in loose folds like a sack of wet laundry. Some parts were pale, almost translucent, while others were raw and mottled. No sign of what did it, not a single tooth mark or claw mark that I could find. I've gotten up close and personal with my fair share of nature's nastiness, but this was unnatural. I fumbled for my phone to take a few pictures and radio for backup. That's when the smell hit me. Not the usual swamp rot stink. This was sharp, metallic somehow, with a tang of something rotten underneath. My stomach turned. I backed away, ready to bolt, but a prickle went down my neck. That feeling you get when something's watching you. It was cranked to a thousand. There, at the edge of the mangroves, was the source. Tall, impossibly tall for a person, and bent into a crooked hunch. Its skin hung off it in folds, bleached white like bone. From where I stood I couldn't make out a face, if it even had one. But I felt it staring straight at me. Panic flared hotter than any Florida sun. I stumbled back, 
tripping over a root and went down hard in the water. The creature didn't rush at me. It just stood there, like it was savoring the moment. Something sharp crunched under my hand, one of the photos I'd taken. I scrambled to my feet, fumbling for the utility knife on my belt. That thing moved then, not fast, but smooth like water flowing, like it was just extending itself, one long step covering the ground I'd just struggled across. I slashed out with the knife, more out of desperate instinct than any real plan. The blade hit its arm, and it let out a hiss like steam venting. The skin sizzled where I cut it, but it didn't slow down. It swiped at me with a clawed hand, and I barely dodged. The claws ripped through my backpack like tissue paper. Then, just as sudden as it started, it was gone. It didn't run. It just kind of dissolved back into the trees, leaving only the sickly stink in its wake. I sprinted out of those mangroves like the devil himself was on my tail. Radioing the park rangers was an exercise in futility. They must have thought I'd finally cracked under the heat. My description a jumble of too tall and skin hanging and smelled like metal. I got mandatory psych leave, which is basically code for, we think you're nuts, but let's be polite about it. Back home, apartment feeling too small and the AC not nearly cold enough, I couldn't stop seeing that... thing. Those empty eyes that weren't eyes. The way it moved. Sleep was a no-go, so I started digging. Old stories about the Seminole, about spirits that strayed from the path and twisted into something monstrous. Myths passed down for a reason, I figured. There's always a grain of truth at the heart of them. I connected with an elder from the Mikasuki tribe. She didn't bat an eye at my story, just nodded and spoke of the Stikini, a hunger spirit, restless and insatiable. It steals not just food, they say, but parts of the people it preys on, their strength, their memories, their will to live. Maybe that's what it did to those other biologists who went missing out here over the years. Maybe that's what it did to me. I spent the next few months in a blur, talking with old-timers who hunted deep in the backcountry, learning lore the tourists never see, found out about wards to slow it down, the right herbs and concoctions that might sting enough to give me a fighting chance. Truth is, I'm not sure I believe in the supernatural, but I'll be damned if I go down without a fight. See, that thing, it took something from me that Tuesday. A piece of my mind, maybe, or a chunk of that naive optimism you have when you're young. But it also left me with a burning kind of fury, the kind that keeps you going when good sense says quit. Today, I'm packing my gear. Got a few tricks up my sleeve, things the park service wouldn't approve of if they knew. But I'm past caring about protocol. That creature's still out there. And if the stories are right, it's getting bolder, hungrier. Time to return the favor. Maybe I'm a fool. Maybe I'm chasing ghosts. Or what's left of my sanity. But maybe, just maybe, tonight I'll finally settle the score. Beads of perspiration dotted my brow, a testament to the suffocating humidity that clung to every inch of the secluded forest, cloaking it like a wet blanket. Summers in the backwoods of Shenandoah National Park were always oppressive, but today, the atmosphere felt downright enervating. I worked for the government in a hush-hush facility hidden among these age-old trees, a lab that most folks on the outside wouldn't dream existed. My name is Clyde Mortensen, and my job, one that'd make your skin crawl if you were privy to half of what went on, involved genetic experiments, the kind that could either save humanity or doom it, depending on who you ask. The facility lay nestled underground beneath a grove of knotted oak trees, invisible to satellites and prying eyes alike. My colleague Dr. Jasperin Taft and I made our way through the steel labyrinth that echoed with each footstep. Our boots clicked against cold metal floors as we moved past biohazard signs and containment units. Mind you, 
We weren't mad scientists playing God. We were just two guys in lab coats trying to understand life's building blocks, sometimes a little too literally if you catch my drift. That morning we received a fresh sample, a biological anomaly found by rangers out in the deeper reaches of the woods. It was bigger than anything we'd encountered before. Not human, not animal. Something else entirely. Jasperin said with typical dry humor as he eyed the container holding our new subject, Looks like Mother Nature's been dabbling in some genetic witchcraft herself. Humor aside, it set an off-putting tone for the day's work, enhancing my innate skepticism towards anything seemingly supernatural. But I wasn't scared or unnerved. No more than usual, anyway. I had science on my side. Until science itself seemed to turn against me. As we pried open the container with clinical precision, something about the sample unnerved me more than I cared to admit. Elongated limbs twisted in unnatural angles and skin that seemed to absorb light rather than reflect it. Grossly fascinating, Jasperin muttered beside me. We should have called for help right then when its first limb twitched ever so slightly against stark white metal but reasoned out, such was our arrogance, that latent neural activity post-mortem wasn't unheard of. Our workday continued uninterrupted by whatever apex predator roamed outside or governmental bureaucrats hovering over our shoulders until dusk fell like a curtain over Shenandoah. That's when peculiar things began happening. Shadows shifting just beyond the range of sensors and equipment, glitching intermittently. Hey Clyde, Jasperin quipped as another monitor flickered off. Did you forget to feed the gremlins again? Despite knowing better than to wander about after sundown, due particularly to rogue bears usually haunting this part of Virginia's wilderness, not for whatever sci-fi slant my job implied happened out there, our specimen demanded frequent observation, part protocol, part magnetic curiosity. Armed only with flashlights and nerves steelier than most, Jasperin and I ventured out into a small clearing that behaved like an airlock between civilization and raw, untamed flora when power shortages locked down our systems unexpectedly. In that slice of isolated wild where mobile reception was a laughable concept at best, calls for backup weren't forthcoming. Just as I knelt down to inspect an external generator covered in claw marks not corresponding with any species documented in these woods, we heard rustling overhead as heavy branches parted above us, causing instinct-driven fear to pool cold at my feet. It dawned on us then. This predatorial presence overhead wasn't something folklore named, nor did it resemble a bear nor even any indigenous fauna calling Virginia home. Hefting up my rifle, standard issue but rarely needed apart from an odd tranquilizer dart or two, I prepared for whatever those branches concealed to emerge silhouetted against Knight's canvas, brandishing Jasperson's shotgun both with fatal determinations fueled by primal survival instincts while understanding painfully that neither myth nor man had vocabulary for what loomed ominously above. Jasperin's eyes met mine. We stood back to back, flashlights sweeping the dark. Neither of us spoke, but our heavy breath said enough. We were alone, unsupported, and scared. Branches above us moved again. Through the canopy, something large shifted its weight. The size of the branches it moved suggested a massive body. We kept our weapons ready and lights fixed on the treetops. Another crack split the silence as a limb gave way under the creature's mass. It descended through the darkness and landed with a ground-shaking impact behind us. We whirled around, Jasperin firing at the dark silhouette that towered over us. The creature screamed, a sound that did not belong to any animal I knew. In that instant, with muzzle flashes revealing glimpses of its form, we saw monstrous limbs covered in coarse fur, barb-like protrusions extending from its spindly arms and eyes that reflected light like an animal caught in headlights. It charged. Jasperine was swatted aside like a ragdoll, his shotgun skittering out of reach. I fired twice in succession, aiming for its chest, 
but doubting my rifle could make much difference against such a formidable creature. The recoil knocked me off balance, and I felt sharp pain as claws raked my side. Wounded but alive, I scrambled to my feet and ran. Behind me came sounds too horrific to process, tearing flesh, snapping bones. Jasperin's choked cries cut disturbingly short. That confirmed it. He hadn't survived this encounter. Cursing my failing flashlight and buckling knees, I pushed onward through the forest towards what Jasperin had called an airlock. Our only hope for safety lay there. However, why hadn't we called for help? Our phones had no signal here. We had known this before stepping into the wilderness. Nobody expected trouble either. After all, it was just a routine check on an external generator. I made it back to the small clearing drenched in cold sweat and gasping for breath. Through pure luck or grace, I slammed the airlock control panel on its outside wall. The door creaked open just wide enough that I could slip inside. Once sealed safely within those walls, I allowed myself to collapse on the floor, letting out sobs for Jasperin that nobody would hear while clawing frantically at my radio mic to alert anyone at base of what just happened outside. A rescue team arrived at dawn. They found what remained of Jasperin strewn across the clearing. Such violence described only in reports following animal attacks, but more ferocious than any bear or wolf we'd known from these woods. During debriefings later, it all became clear. Someone mentioned legends of an old predator species, rumored to dwell deeper within these parts, that no modern record had ever acknowledged as truth until now. Days passed with search parties finding mere traces, but never catching sight of whatever caused such gruesome chaos that night. They posted warnings and restricted access around where our horror unfolded. Only rumors circulated among those who ventured nearby of something out there beyond human understanding. Candles formed a tribute where Jasperine fell in service to his job. Sole reminder our encounter wasn't some forest myth, but real flesh and blood. Surviving meant carrying his memory and ensuring life went on despite knowing beasts lurked where light didn't reach. Where according to records, nothing should exist, yet did in terrifying physical form with consequence unbearably real for those who crossed paths by accident or dark twist of fate. I'm Hank Emerson, a retired private investigator, and now working as a handyman in my quaint little town of Grover's Mill, New Jersey. People around here often joke about the 1938 radio broadcast that convinced some folks space invaders were attacking. All laugh and jest, but my story is all too real and bone-chilling. One afternoon, after finishing up some work, I decided to take a walk through Willow Creek Forest Preserve, a sprawling woodland area that stretches for miles. A gentle breeze rustled through the leaves above as I strolled along the trail, paying close attention to the vibrant colors of fall. Abruptly, I stumbled onto a gruesome scene, a torn-up campsite right on the edge of the trail. Shredded tents, scattered belongings, and traces of blood drenched in the soil painted disturbing images in my mind. Engulfed with a sense of duty to find out what caused this horrifying act, I began investigating. Asking around soon led me to meet Marla Johnson and Reverend Evans Blake, both locals from around the area who had become enthralled with odd occurrences happening over the past few months. They revealed tales of livestock mutilated and whispers about a monstrous humanoid creature lurking in the shadows. Piecing together accounts from locals and carefully observing my surroundings during nightly walks through the forest reserve, my skepticism gradually dissolved into concern. One night changed my life when I found myself face to face with a terror that words struggled to articulate. I was walking deeper into Willow Creek Forest Preserve than ever before. The sun dipped below the horizon and darkness fell like a curtain upon the trees. As moonlight seeped through breaks in leaves overhead, I suddenly heard it, a deep, guttural growl from nearby. Turning slowly to face where the unsettling sound emanated from, 
my eyes barely made out an enormous figure propped against a tree trunk. Towering well over six feet tall, a wolf-like creature stood upon two legs, with its piercing yellow eyes radiating with something menacing. A thick, muscular body with coarse fur extended down to arms that clenched massive claws. The sight of this abomination drained all rational thought from me. I wanted to call out for help, but my voice couldn't rise above the pounding drumbeat of my heart. That's when the plot thickened. The creature lunged and savagely attacked a group of campers who had strayed off the main trail and set up their tents in an area we later found out not far from where the first gruesome incident unfolded. High-pitched screams tore through the night air as frantic people sprinted past me, covered in deep gashes clawed across their limbs and torsos as if shredded by knives. Scattered belongings lay strewn about on blood-soaked grass, illuminated by a flickering campfire. It was at that moment that Marla and Reverend Blake rushed into view, having heard commotion coming from a distance away. We quickly exchanged information on our previous investigation. As we caught our breaths and tried to piece together what we'd witnessed that night, we desperately attempted to dial 911, though reception failed us in these depths of the forest. Now understanding there was no reaching anyone beyond those trees for help, it slowly dawned on us it would be up to only ourselves to endure or confront this terrible monstrosity. We pressed onward, following the disarray of broken branches and trampled grass left by the creature's ferocious recent attack. The very ground seemed stained red from brutality that fateful evening as we pressed deeper into its lair. Determined to stop this beast once and for all, Marla clutched her phone tightly to her heart like a talisman, while Reverend Blake held a crucifix solemnly in his loosely shaking hands, hope shimmering among us like a flame straining to stay alive against a relentless wind. Suddenly, it was upon us again. Brazenly stepping into our midst, the towering wolf creature asserted its dominance with another monstrous snarl. Blood and saliva dripped from bared teeth as it eyed our group threateningly, seemingly taunting us as the very embodiment of everything we fear. Gathering our wits, we knew that standing still and waiting for the creature to attack was not an option. I yelled, We need to run! My voice cracked with fear, but there was no time for embarrassment. As we sprinted through the dark forest, tree branches whipping our faces, Marla gasped with every step, and Reverend Blake muttered a continuous prayer under his breath. We glanced back occasionally to check if the wolf-like creature was following us. Its yellow eyes seemed to pierce us like daggers. At one point, we reached a clearing where the moonlight shone brightly through the canopy above. Our race against time had depleted our energy, but stopping was not an option. Reverend Blake panted, We... We need to find some help somewhere. I nodded in agreement, all of us knowing very well that it was easier said than done. The seclusion of the forest did not lend itself to immediate assistance or rescue. With limited options and no plan in mind, we continued running. As we trudged through the darkness, Marla noticed a cabin up ahead. We approached with cautious hope, praying for someone inside who could help us. I pounded on the door as Marla and Reverend Blake tried calling out for help once more, their voices pleading and trembling with fear. To our surprise and relief, the door creaked open to reveal a middle-aged man holding a shotgun across his chest. He took one look at our terror-stricken faces and waved us inside. We hurriedly scrambled into the cabin. After barricading the door with furniture as best as we could, the man introduced himself as John. He listened intently as we relayed our tale of the wolf-like creature that had so brutally attacked earlier. John's face grew pale with every word, but offered us shelter for the night. With no better alternative available and sheer exhaustion taking over, we gratefully accepted his offer. Despite the tense atmosphere, our bodies demanded rest. We slept that night in shifts, one guarding the barricade at all times, while the other two dozed off. Reverend Blake awoke me from my turn at rest. I could see the stark fear in his eyes. The night had been eerily quiet until that moment. Suddenly, 
we heard heavy footsteps nearing the cabin. I tensed and grasped John's shotgun firmly, knowing that my resolve would be put to the test. The wolf creature lunged at the door, snarling and clawing ferociously. Panic seared through us as the monster outside fought to break down the barricade we had constructed. Desperation set in as it shoved against the barrier, splintering wood with every surge. John glanced towards a back window and urged Marla and Reverend Blake to escape while they still could. They looked hesitant, but complied as I prepared to take a shot if needed. As our companions made their way through the window, I held my breath and aimed the shotgun at the door. If it came down to it, I had no choice but to use whatever force necessary to survive. Suddenly, fortune favored us. Through cracks in the doorway, we could see flashing blue and red lights approaching rapidly. A gunshot rang from afar. A local hunter had found our distress signals from earlier that day. The deafening howl of the creature echoed through the night as it retreated into darkness, prompted by fear or perhaps an innate sense of self-preservation. John pulled me toward him and gave me a quick nod of approval before guiding me out of the now-ruined cabin. Reunited with Marla and Reverend Blake, we recounted our brush with death as authorities arrived on scene. In those brief moments, life had been reduced to its rawest form, survival instilled deeply within each of us, driving our every action. Although the wolf-like creature had vanished, the knowledge of its existence and our narrow escape from its clutches would forever remain, leaving a disconcerting reminder of the unknown dangers lurking within the depths of any forest. I stumbled upon the crime scene in a small town called Pineswood, located deep within the woods of Oregon. It was a particularly unnerving sight, but before I could process what my eyes had fallen upon, a local named Jebediah Clarkson hollered at me from afar. Hey there, what brings you to Pineswood? You here to help us? He asked. I'm Frank Hutchinson, a writer, I said, visiting here on vacation. We exchanged stories, and I learned about his life as the town's eccentric handyman. As our conversations progressed, I found myself invited to join Jebediah and his cohorts as they investigated an unsettling murder. Bound by a morbid curiosity, I agreed. On our way to the tormented area, cop lights filled the street with a tense atmosphere. Lisa Bransford, an aspiring detective, described how everything we knew about standard crime scenes would be challenged tonight. The victims were left mutilated in ways most of us had never seen before. I didn't suspect anything otherworldly, yet. Perched on the edge of Pineswood Forest stood a row of shabby cabins where the horrifying scene awaited us. The group expectedly fell silent as we entered. Pushed up against the nearest wall and missing parts of their flesh, the corpses were grotesquely scarred. Despite my initial shock, we began scouring for clues and any sign of the villain. However, every lead only led to more questions without answers. Then we found tracks leading into the forest, footprints that appeared reptilian in nature. Soon we were pushing through a claustrophobic clearing within the dense forest. Alex Thompson, an avid outdoorsman among us, pointed out strange flora he had never encountered before. Sprawling vines thorny enough to shred through tough fabrics were wound around innocent trees like serpentine ropes. It seemed as if nature itself had been manipulated by the hands of an unknown menace, and whatever that force was, we could feel it looming closer with each step we took. The deeper we went, the darker the forest became. Branches, ominously interlocked overhead, blurring the line between nature and something more sinister. As our search continued, we stumbled upon a decrepit cabin nestled at the heart of Pineswood Forest. It was all too eerie to be a coincidence. As we approached with trepidation, the odor of rot and decay filled our nostrils. Inside, the walls were splayed with claw marks and gore, a ghastly reminder of events that took place. Cautiously, 
We navigated the darkened room when suddenly there was movement. A blood-curdling screech echoed throughout the space, making our hearts race faster than ever before. The terrifying abomination before us was monstrous in size. Each movement conducted by its reptilian limbs left grotesque cracks on the ground. Lashing out its clawed talons, it effortlessly flung Jebediah across the cabin. Choked gasps escaped our mouths as his lifeless body hit the wall hard enough to have shattered every bone in his body. There wasn't time to dwell on his death. Alex scrambled to his feet while Lisa grabbed whatever weapons she could find, an axe and a revolver. With gravelly, fierce determination to survive etched on each face, we prepared for a gruesome fight against this living nightmare that conspired in our midst. We mustered all courage possible, as these gruesome terrorists might be of this earth or beyond, but wanted nothing more than to claim their malicious victory over innocent lives. With the monstrous creature before us, there was no time to think or strategize. It was clear we needed to do something before all of our lives were gruesomely ended. We need to get out of here, shouted Alex. Lisa and I nodded in agreement, but fear paralyzed our legs. Despite the urgency, we couldn't find the willpower to escape. It was then that we heard a faint voice from behind us. Guys! Jebediah wheezed with strained breaths, miraculously alive. Go! Please! His survival rekindled the fire of hope within us, and we managed to take action. Weaving through the wreckage of the cabin, we barely managed to avoid being eviscerated by the creature's massive claws. It let out another blood-curdling screech, sending chills down our spines as it pursued us relentlessly. We stumbled our way back outside and sprinted through Pineswood Forest, disoriented but fueled by adrenaline. The monster's unnerving roars echoed through the forest as we made our desperate escape, its unmistakable footfalls indicating it was hot on our trail. Knowing how futile it would be to call for help in these remote woods, we directed all our energy toward running faster than ever before. Still gripping the axe and revolver tightly in her hands, Lisa attempted to use them against this seemingly invincible antagonist. But every bullet and swing were fruitless, as they only seemed to further infuriate this menacing beast. By some stroke of luck or divine intervention, we stumbled upon a cave hidden deep within Pineswood Forest that seemed like the perfect place to hide from this murderous monstrosity. Without hesitation, we darted inside and scrambled to find a narrow passage where the creature would be unable to follow. The seemingly endless twists and turns within the cave provided just enough cover for us as we ducked behind a heap of rocks. We allowed ourselves a moment to catch our dwindling breaths as we listened intently, praying that the creature had given up its pursuit. For a precarious moment, we held on to hope. Reflecting on the appearance of our assailant with newfound dread, my mind desperately tried to make sense of its twisted form. Its scales and snake-like head were an unnerving mix of alien and reptilian features, a menacing abomination that brought into question everything I knew to be true about reality. As soon as the distant snarls began to fade, we knew we couldn't afford to wait any longer. We tiptoed our way out of the cave, doing our best not to make a sound while listening for any signs that the beast might still be nearby. With each step toward freedom, the weight of our ordeal began to sink in. The unknown species that had nearly claimed our lives made these woods feel as though they belonged to another world. One cruel, unforeseeable twist in fate had nearly sealed our doom in such a devastating manner. Finally, we emerged from Pineswood Forest, tired and traumatized but alive. Our relief was palpable as we vowed never to return to those cursed woods again. For who knew what other horrors lurked within? In the days that followed, Jebediah eventually succumbed to his brutal injuries as Lisa and I mourned his passing. The three of us should have been just more victims to this mysterious fiend of nature. Yet instead, we are left here with memories filled with nightmare-fueled dread and an unending curiosity about the terrifying creature still prowling Pineswood Forest, just waiting for its next prey. And as for me... I ponder my own future, 
knowing full well that it will always cast a dark shadow over my life. We'd barely escaped Pineswood with only a harrowing tale of bloodshed and terror to remind us of how close death had visited. Every night since then, I have wondered if our tormentor had been appeased, or if it remains hidden in the shadows, waiting for the day when the scent of fear brought it forth once again. A thought that haunts my very existence, leaving me a mere shell of the person I once was. This happened to me on July 4th, 1999. Reckon most folks were barbecuing and watching fireworks that night. Me? I was lost in the middle of nowhere with something out of a nightmare hot on my heels. My name's Travis Bishop. Search and rescue in Yellowstone National Park for more years than I care to count. Married, but that summer my wife Sarah was visiting her folks back east. Grew up in the mountains. Figured I knew these trails better than my own backyard. Turns out even the most familiar places can hide some damn ugly secrets. The call came in on a Saturday afternoon. A pair of college kids, overdue from an overnight hike, last radioed in from somewhere on the Pelican Creek Trail. That area ain't no walk in the park. Rough terrain, dense forest, and plenty of grizzlies to keep you on your toes. But those kids seemed experienced from the itinerary, so I didn't sweat it too much when we first headed out. Figured they were just late. Maybe one twisted an ankle. My team was me and three rookies. Two burly guys, Ben and Carter, and a girl named Kayla. She reminded me of a younger Sarah, all bright-eyed and eager, and it made me more determined than usual to get this done right. We followed the kids' planned route, picking up the trail easy enough. Few stray water bottles, an abandoned granola bar wrapper, typical hiker stuff. Then things got weird. We stumbled on their campsite as the sun dipped down, and it looked like something had rampaged through it. Tent ripped open, backpacks torn to shreds, sleeping bags unrolled and covered in this sticky, dark substance. And blood. A whole lot more blood than you'd see from a twisted ankle. Radio crackled and fizzled. No reply from base when I tried to report in. Must have been a dead zone deeper in the park. That unease settled in my gut the kind you get when the wilderness shifts from familiar to something else entirely. Ben and Carter looked rattled, and even Kayla lost some of her pep. We decided to hold position till first light, standard procedure if there's no immediate risk. Tried to get some rest, but that nagging feeling kept me wide awake, my ears straining for every rustle and snap. Around midnight, it started. Sounds from somewhere deep in the pines, heavy footsteps way too big to be human, cracking branches and low, throaty growls that didn't match any bear or mountain lion I'd ever heard. The rookies went rigid, fear a palpable thing in the night air. That's when we saw it. It moved through the trees like a living shadow, its bulk immense even in the darkness. Then the moon broke through the clouds, just for a second, and I saw its eyes, yellow, blazing, and too far apart to belong to anything natural. I squeezed off a few shots, more to boost morale than actually land a hit. The growls morphed into a screech that set my teeth on edge, and the creature was gone, swallowed back by the night. Come morning, there was no time for deliberation. I told the rookies we were packing up what was left of the campsite and heading back toward the trailhead fast as we could. But whatever was out there, it was tracking us. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig made us jump. My nerves were thrumming like a live wire, the seasoned ranger in me fighting with the instinct to turn and bolt like a scared rabbit. Kayla couldn't take it. I was giving her a pep talk, trying to mask my own worry, when she just broke. She tore off blind panic pushing her deeper into the trees toward the rustle that maybe was, maybe wasn't the creature. Ben swore and wanted to go after her, but I had to hold him back. The mission was to get out, get help, not add another victim to whatever was hunting us. We heard her scream, high-pitched, choked off, then sickly, crunching sounds more animal than human. Then, silence. 
never found a trace of her or the college kids. We stumbled out of the trees by nightfall, me barely able to hold it together enough to relay what happened back to base. They sent in the big guns then, state troopers, helicopters, the works. Sweep the area for days, turned up nothing. Officially, the whole incident was a likely bear attack, with the missing persons cases still open. But I ain't dumb, and neither were the folks who took over the search. We all saw those eyes, heard those inhuman sounds, smelled that rank, coppery scent hanging in the air. I don't drink much, especially not on the job, but after I turned in my badge, got myself a bottle of whiskey, and didn't surface till it was gone. Never even told Sarah the whole story. Some things, it's better if they stay buried. Word got around, though. Became that whispered tale you tell around a flickering campfire, a warning to the cocky hikers who think they've got the wilderness tamed. Folks started calling me Yellow Eyes, and I let them. The name fit. A reminder of what was out there, still watching. Sarah couldn't handle it. Couldn't handle the way I flinched at the dark, the way every creaky floorboard sounded like footsteps following me. Couldn't handle seeing the light fade from my eyes. We drifted apart. The divorce finalized a couple of winters later. Not her fault. Reckon I wasn't much to live with back then. I moved away from Yellowstone. Got a job in construction. Far from the shadowed forests. Put tools in my hands. Focused on things I could build instead of tearing apart. Thought I could bury the memories under work and sweat and a few bottles of beer to help me sleep. But some nights, mostly those with a wind that howls like something more than just wind, I'll swear I hear those growls again. Sometimes, looking out my window at the street lights cutting into the darkness, I think maybe the old stories were right. Maybe there are wild places the maps don't show, and wild things still lurking in the shadows. Places where men like me ain't the top of the food chain. Nights like that, I'll reach for that half-empty bottle of whiskey, but then my hand will pause. I'll think of Kayla's bright smile, of Sarah's worried face, of those damned yellow eyes, and I'll close the cabinet, walk over to the window, and stare defiantly back at the night. Whatever lurks out there, it took a lot from me, but it won't take it all. Reckon I learned that lesson the hard way, and I ain't about to forget it any time soon. This happened down in the Everglades a few years back. Me and my buddy Caden, we'd done a lot of camping, even a bit of hiking in the Rockies the summer before. Figured we were seasoned outdoorsmen, at least as seasoned as two college kids could be. Name's Everett, by the way. Folks call me Ev for short. Everglades ain't like those rocky mountain trails. Place feels different, older somehow. Like you're stepping into a world left behind by time. There's this weight to the air, thick and humid, and the trees with their roots like gnarled fingers reaching out of the water. That thick blanket of Spanish moss overhead that shuts out the sun gets to a guy after a while, rented a canoe, planned to spend a few nights paddling deeper in, maybe do some fishing. Second day out, we were following this narrow little waterway when the smell hit us, like meat gone bad but sweeter and wrong, made the hairs stand up on the back of my neck. We looked at each other, both of us thinking the same thing, paddled further, figuring whatever left that carcass was long gone by now. That's the thing about nature. It's brutal out there sometimes, and we weren't about to lose our lunch at the first sign of death. Besides, Caden was always up for a challenge, reckon he figured it might make a good story later. Half hour later, we found the source. A gator carcass, half submerged in the muck. The thing was huge, easily twelve feet long, but its belly was ripped open wide. No natural predator around there does that kind of damage. There was something else, too, a trail of blood leading further into the swamp, away from the water. We got closer, curiosity winning out over that prickle of unease. 
That's when we saw the footprints. Not gator tracks, too long and narrow. Looked almost human, except for the claw marks at the end of each toe. The blood trail led right next to them. Now, both of us were good and creeped out. Should have turned right around there and then. But Caden, he gets this stubborn streak, wanted a photo. I said no way, but you know how it is. Sometimes, your buddy gets that look in his eye, and you just shut up and follow along. He was focusing his camera, snapping pics of the carcass and the weird tracks, when I heard it. A rustling from the thick undergrowth near the bank. Figured it was a deer or something come to investigate. It wasn't a deer. The thing that came out of those bushes was tall and spindly, with skin hanging loose off bones that stuck out at odd angles. It moved with this jerky, unnatural motion, like its limbs were too long, and the head too small for that big, misshapen body, the face all stretched and wrong. The eyes were worst, those flat black pits that seemed to look right through you. There was blood smeared around its mouth. Caden screamed. I dropped the paddle, scrambling back towards the edge of the canoe, heart pounding in my ears. It was on him so fast, its long arms wrapping around him like a snake before I could even react. Caden thrashed and yelled, but it was too strong. I could hear the crunching of his bones before it dragged him bodily back into the undergrowth. His screams faded into gargling sobs, then cut off completely. I sat there frozen for a long minute. Then survival kicked in, grabbed the paddle and rowed like my life depended on it. Because it did didn't stop till I was so far back down the waterway I figured I'd lost it. Collapsing into the boat, I sobbed for what felt like hours. Never told anyone the whole truth about what happened to Caden. Police report blamed it on a gator attack and, hey, who was I to argue? That story is easier to swallow than the one about the starved, twisted thing that haunted my nightmares for a long time after. They found his camera later. Smashed, but with the memory card intact. Photos of the gator carcass, the strange prints. And then, one blurry image caught mid-motion of something long, pale, and inhuman lunging through the trees. The police deleted it, called it a trick of the light. I knew better. I try to stick to city life now. Open spaces make me nervous. Crowds of people, too. Always scanning faces, wondering if I'll catch a glimpse of that tall, emaciated figure lurking at the edge of the crowd. And on dark nights, when the wind rustles the leaves outside my window, I think I hear Caden's screams and that low, gurgling growl echoing back. It felt good to get some of that off my chest, though. A few months back, I started looking online, digging through old news reports, backwoods forums, those spooky websites filled with local legends. Turns out I wasn't the first to encounter something strange out in the Everglades. There were stories going back centuries, whispers of hauntings and disappearances, sightings of a creature nobody could quite describe. And that's when I started to put it all together. Those stories of the swamp monster, the hungry spirit that stalked the edges of the civilized world, the Wendigo. They say it's born out of starvation, a twisted reflection of greed and excess. Out there in the heart of the swamp, where resources are scarce and nature takes no prisoners, well, it makes a certain kind of terrible sense. I don't know what I'm going to do with this knowledge. Part of me wants to shout it from the rooftops, get some group of outdoorsmen with the right firepower to hunt the thing down before it can hurt anyone else. But Caden and I... We were no slouches when it came to wilderness survival, and it still took him. The other part of me, the part that wakes me up in a cold sweat some nights, knows that's a losing battle. You can't kill a legend, not one that's born from the land itself. Some lessons you learn the hard way. Nature is a brutal place, and sometimes the most dangerous creatures aren't the ones you find in the field guides. They say some parts of that swamp are cursed. Got a feeling the old stories aren't just legends after all. So I guess all I can do now is warn others. If you're headed out to the Everglades, 
If you're the type who likes to stray off the beaten path, well, just remember, you're not alone out there. Watch for those skinny footprints in the mud. Listen for the rustling in the undergrowth when it gets too still. And whatever you do, don't follow the smell of rotting meat. Some hungers can never be satisfied, and some predators never stop hunting. Sometimes the most mundane tasks can lead to extraordinary events. This was the case when, upon finishing a sandwich for lunch, I left the sterile comfort of my office and ventured deeper into the depths of the research facility where I worked, a place only a handful of people knew existed, nestled within the thick forests of the Pacific Northwest. My job involved clandestine genetic experiments, nothing too outlandish for someone like me. Kendall Rigby was not a name that drew attention. That anonymity had always served me well in service of Uncle Sam. Nudging my way past a heavy security door, I entered the high security wing to check on Project Lycanthrope's latest trials. It was then I found my colleague, Dr. Oberon Voss, his eyes wide with an unreadable expression as he motioned me over without a word. I clutched at my sidearm, an instinctual habit, though I couldn't place why a feeling of unease had begun to bubble up from my gut. Look at this, Oberon whispered urgently. He showed me his tablet displaying an alarming rate of cellular mutation in Subject C, a result that seemed impossible with our current set of variables. The room suddenly felt uncomfortably small, as if the walls were inching closer with each erratic data point. We heard an ungodly sound echoing from one of the containment rooms, even through layers of concrete and reinforced steel, it chilled us both to our cores. Neither dared call for help. After all, when you dabble in secrets so dark, who can you trust? The facility was designed as a labyrinth to confuse any unwelcome guests, but now we felt like rats trapped within its innards. In that moment of tension cracked an awful joke. One must laugh in the face of danger to keep their wits about them. Hope that's not your stomach complaining about cafeteria food again, I said with forced levity. Oberon scoffed nervously. If whatever made that sound is unhappy with meals, we're no more than appetizers. Despite our attempts at humor, we could not ignore that something within our controlled environment had gone horrifically awry. We moved cautiously towards Sector 3, where heavy claw marks now marred once immaculate walls, Evidence that Subject C was not only mutating but growing stronger and more volatile. Peering through reinforced glass into an observation chamber, what we saw defied explanation. A creature born straight out of nightmares, yet comprised solely of flesh and blood we had tampered with excessively. Its form was vaguely human, but twisted grotesquely. Muscles bulged unnaturally under bristled fur that covered its spotted hide. Its eyes glowed with an unholy amber light as they fixed on us with predatory fixation. Chattering came over the radio, panic-stricken voices reporting breaches in multiple sectors, and gunshots rang in distant corridors. The facility erupted in chaos as others like our Subject C began their unrestrained rampage. Our game turned deadly serious when another researcher burst into the hallway, half-dragging Dr. Elodie Karanen, whose lab coat was shredded and stained crimson. Her injuries spoke volumes about what awaited us should we meet these creations face to face. It went straight through Marlowe, Elodie gasped. One did not need more explanation to comprehend Mr. Marlowe's unfortunate fate at claws or teeth unknown. Now forced into action by survival's imperative call and hoping our limited firepower would suffice against such monstrosities, we sought escape or if fate decreed, some heroic last stand among scattered papers and flickering lights. We formed a hasty plan for evacuation while attempting barricades barely deserving of the name. Our communication lines were severed. One could assume intentionally, fragments pieced together between breathless commands and shrieks conveyed chaos outside our feeble fortress. The creation hunting us down knew this terrain better than any natural predator knew its woods. As time slowed and adrenalized seconds stretched into eternity's mockery, we caught glimpses between frenzied respites. 
dark shapes coalescing along the forest's edge beyond break room windows, spatters painting corners in grotesque earth tones, unheard echoes tracking unseen dread which gripped every nerve-ending whispering warnings. Elodie and I pushed furniture against the door, the weight offering cold comfort. Our hands moved with purpose, but our minds raced with fear. We knew communication was essential. Our mobile signals failed, crushed under an oppressive dead zone that seemed as much a part of this nightmare as the creature hunting us. We need to reach the lab's landline, Elodie whispered, her voice barely reaching my ears over the creature's guttural roars outside. I nodded. The lab was a maze of halls and sterile rooms. If we could reach the main office, we might contact the authorities. We shuffled through dim corridors, eyes alert for any movement. The emergency lights offered little help, casting long shadows behind every piece of equipment. The door to the lab came into view. My heart hammered in my chest, each beat echoing in my ears like a drum of war. Elodie reached for the handle when a grotesque limb burst through the adjacent window. Thick, sinewy, and covered in bristles, it groped for anything in reach. Panic drove us back into the hall as we heard the window frame give way under a weight it was never meant to hold. Elodie looked at me with wide eyes before dashing towards the stairs. I followed without thought. It was there, at the bottom step, that we saw it for the first time. Enormous, unlike any natural form life should take, its body was a mass of muscle and fur, spotted with lesions oozing dark fluid. It moved too fast for its size. We turned and fled up the stairs to rooftops unknown to us but confiningly familiar to our hunter. The sound of claws on concrete confirmed our worst fears. Our only option remained to hide and hope rescue would find us before starvation, or worse. Hours passed, or maybe days. Time lost all meaning. We caught rainwater and ate from old candy vending machines, survival being our only agenda. The final day, or what felt like day, arrived when helicopters thundered overhead. Their searchlights found us just as that monstrous form caught Elodie's leg in its jaw. Rescuers rappelled down, their arms grabbing us with purposeful strength even as gunfire rained upon the creature dragging Elodie away. I never learned what became of her or Marlowe. My focus narrowed to therapy sessions and interviews with men in suits who always left more questions than answers. Strangely enough, this facility and its horrors disappeared from public knowledge just as quickly as they had come into mine. I woke up with a slight headache, probably from the beer I had after my late shift at the warehouse. My name's Bartholomew Heller, but my friends call me Bart. I'm just a regular guy, working to pay the bills and keep a roof over my head. I was walking back home through Deerfield Forest, a large woodland area in Massachusetts. The sun had already set, casting elongated shadows as I strolled along the dirt path. Thinking about my recent breakup with Clarice was unexpected company for the walk, but it happened regardless. A loud rustling suddenly caught my attention. I froze. There, about twenty feet away, stood a strange creature unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Tall and terrifying, it appeared somewhat like a wolf, but walked on two legs like a man. As the creature eyed me menacingly, my heart pounded in my chest. Fear gripped me in an unbreakable vice as this unknown predator seemed to challenge my presence in its domain. A glint of light caught in the distance alerted me that someone else was nearby. An elderly woman walking her dog. Hey! I yelled out to her, desperate for help. She looked at me, puzzled by my panic-stricken face. Run! Go back! I urged her, pointing at the horrifying creature before us. Startled by my warning and the expression on my face, she turned on her heels and fled with her dog close behind. My survival instinct kicked in as I decided to make a run for it, too. The night air sliced through me as adrenaline coursed through my veins. 
In spite of everything that happened to me today, work issues, thoughts about Clarice, this danger before me was all that mattered now. Suddenly, there was another blur of movement in front of me, something even more sinister and menacing than before. A group of people appeared to be restrained, their faces contorted in panic and despair. Quickly, I realized what this creature was capable of. It didn't just stalk and hunt. It imprisoned its victims, too. The blood-curdling screams of those trapped souls spurred me into action. Heart pounding in my chest, I looked around for anything to use as a weapon. A rusted pipe caught my attention. I picked it up and gripped it tightly, attempting to summon courage. With every ounce of strength I possessed, I charged at the beast, swinging the pipe with lethal intent. The creature snarled ferociously as it responded to my attack by baring its vicious teeth. I was determined not to become yet another victim. Time seemed to slow down as I continued assaulting the monstrous being. A fevered sense of purpose consumed me. There would be no escape for either of us from this confrontation. It didn't take long for me to tire out, sweat streaming down my face as the unforgiving reality of the situation became more evident. While I managed to evade the creature's attacks up until now, an incredible feat on its own, I knew that unless someone came to my aid, help was unlikely to arrive in time. As if by some divine intervention, gunshots rang out from the woods. The creature stumbled back as its rage intensified with each bullet piercing its grotesque hide. Hope began blossoming within me. Maybe today would be the end of this nightmare after all. Staggering toward the tree line where help had come from, my breaths grew heavier and more labored while this beast would not relent despite suffering gunshots. Quickly looking over my shoulder, I saw its hateful eyes fixate on me, the epitome of unyielding evil intent on devouring me whole. The woods seemed to close in around me as I made my way closer to the source of the gunshots. My lungs burned, my legs ached with every step, but one thought kept pushing me forward. There was someone out there who could help me. When I finally stumbled upon a small hunting camp, I crumpled onto the ground, relieved beyond measure. The owner of the camp was a man named Tom, who was as shocked as anyone to see a stranger in this part of the woods. I quickly explained the situation, my words spilling out in frantic gasps. Tom listened attentively and once I finished, he nodded with grave concern. He immediately offered his help, telling me that he had some experience dealing with wild animals and had even seen this wolf-like creature from a distance, though he hadn't realized how savage it was until now. Together, we formed a plan. I would stay in the safety of his camp while he ventured out to distract and possibly drive off the creature. While it wasn't much of a plan, it was the best we could do given our limited resources and desperate situation. Tom armed himself with his rifle and set off into the woods soon after. As I sat alone in his hunting cabin with nothing but adrenaline coursing through my veins and fear gnawing at my insides, I found myself wishing desperately that I could help more. But as minutes turned into hours and night began to fall once again over the woods, I knew something had gone wrong. Tom should have returned long before dark so that we could reassess our situation if necessary. The deafening silence outside worried me. Each minute Tom didn't return made my chest tighten. Soon enough, though, I heard footsteps approaching. My heart pounded in anticipation, whichever end result it brought, either safety or danger was near. The door creaked open slowly, and it wasn't Tom who entered. It was the creature, pierced by several bullets but far from dead. It snarled with unfathomable rage, its sights set on me. There was nowhere to hide, and without Tom's rifle, my defenses were meager. I prayed for a miracle as the creature advanced, and just as it was about to pounce, a loud crack echoed through the cabin. The monster reeled back in pain, fresh blood dripping from its shoulder. Tom emerged from the shadows behind the creature, battered and bruised, but determinedly holding another rifle. He doubled back after being injured, 
knowing his first weapon wouldn't be enough to finish off this relentless beast. With undeniable courage burning in his eyes, he fired shot after shot into the creature, forcing it further back. Finally, with one last scream of pain, the creature stumbled out of the open door and retreated into the woods. Its piercing eyes flashed one final time before it disappeared into darkness. Exhausted and panting heavily, Tom collapsed beside me. Once we had caught our breaths, we cautiously ventured outside to make sure the creature truly was gone, and more importantly, not coming back any time soon. The night air was silent once again. Its defeat weighed down upon us both. We spent that night in fearful anticipation of an ambush that never came. As the sun finally rose on what felt like a lifetime of uncertainty, we left behind our makeshift campsite and found our way back to civilization. The experience left us scarred emotionally. I never learned Tom's full story or why he had devoted his life to hunting in seclusion. But what mattered most was our shared survival against an enemy so terrifyingly incomprehensible. In those dark moments of fear and desperation in that cabin deep within the woods, I reminisced about my friends who didn't make it past our first encounter with that horrifying villain's attack, their voices forever imprinted in my memories. I've never encountered a werewolf since that time, and Tom and I couldn't prove their existence, but the creature we fought against was undoubtedly more than a mere wild animal. It bore an almost human intelligence in its eyes, and its relentless pursuit of me was fueled by a hunger so malevolent that it could not be mistaken for anything other than pure evil. As the years have passed, the night we faced that gruesome monster has remained in my thoughts, though I cannot forget the friends we lost to the beast's assault. I find solace in knowing that Tom and I had overcome such an inexplicable horror. I woke up with a pounding headache and a groan. Last night's party lingered in my mind as I dragged myself out of bed. To Jasper for making partner, I muttered recalling the impromptu celebration that had escalated quickly. There was something about the abandoned warehouse at the edge of town that called for a wild party. Timothy Klein, you crazy bastard, I whispered to the reflection in the bathroom mirror, splashing water onto my face. My work as an insurance investigator meant I spent a lot of time alone, analyzing cases and people's lives transformed into dry reports on paper. My job was to detect anything fraudulent so that our company didn't end up paying large sums for fake claims. My childhood was rather ordinary, single mom, older sister who picked on me, and the usual middle-class struggles. As I headed back to the warehouse to retrieve my car, the dark city streets seemed sleepy and indifferent. The real-life location where everything happened is Route 65 on N. Harbor Drive, California. Gray shadows cast by empty buildings stretched across cracked asphalt. The old industrial area hadn't seen much use since companies left town in search of more prosperous zones. Upon arriving at the warehouse, nothing seemed amiss. It was abandoned like always, and my car stood parked out front. The faint stench of stale beer reminded me of last night's revelry. As I inspected my car for any damage or signs of theft, I noticed a dark stain on the floor near one of the tires. As I came closer, it turned out to be blood. Not much, but alarming nonetheless. That wasn't there after our party, was it? My investigator instincts kicked in. Checking around cautiously, I found a trail leading toward an unexplored section of the compound. The secluded area seemed much darker than before probably just clouds passing over the moon, casting eerie shadows off twisted metal debris. My heart thumped loudly as I pushed the door open. The warehouse had definitely seen better days. Inside, the air was thick with something unnameable, an unsettling heaviness that seemed to surround me. Glancing down another corridor, I caught sight of an unusual figure stalking through the shadows. Even from a distance, 
it appeared otherworldly. Humanoid in shape, but with long limbs covered in what appeared to be scales. Its head bore reptilian markings, and its eyes gleamed unnaturally. I froze, unsure if this was some prank or messed up joke, but unwilling to find out more. Suddenly, my phone rang loudly, jolting me out of my paralyzed state and sending me stumbling backward in fear. Tim, what's going on? You left the party so abruptly, whispered Jasper on the line. I found something, man, I admitted, voice shaking as I tried to gather my thoughts. A trail of blood and some creature hiding in here. Blood? You think one of us got hurt last night? I don't know, I replied, still struggling with disbelief. Whatever this thing is, I'm not sticking around to find out. Moments later, Jasper arrived at the warehouse with our friend Cassandra McRae. We proceeded cautiously back to the area where I had spotted the reptilian creature. No trace remained other than lingering feelings of dread. We need to call for help, insisted Cassandra, her face pale and concerned. You don't know what that thing could have done. But what do we even say? asked Jasper incredulously. Hey there, Officer Smith. We were partying last night and saw a giant lizard man lurking around. They'll throw us in jail for public intoxication. There was no denying that their skepticism mirrored my own doubts about the ordeal. Maybe it was just some weird hallucination triggered by stress or lack of sleep. But something in the back of my mind insisted that this encounter was all too real. We searched the compound, adrenaline pumping loudly in our ears. Just as we were about to call it quits, I caught sight of a small room off to the side, nearly hidden by shadows. Approaching cautiously, I discovered a gruesome scene. The stench hit me first. It was the unmistakable smell of blood, stronger here than outside on the asphalt. Inside the filthy room stood a table covered with broken glass and bits of metal, some bloodied tools lying amidst the chaos. I hesitated my breath caught in my throat at the sight before me. Cass, Jasper, come look at this. I called out to my friends, trying to keep my voice steady. As they joined me in the small room, their expressions mirrored my own shock. We knew we needed to do something, but what? What could we possibly do against something that seemed straight out of a horror movie? Let's call for help, urged Cassandra once more. We'll call the police, and tell them we found a crime scene, agreed Jasper. We don't need to mention the creature, just describe the state of this room. I nodded in agreement. That seemed like a logical plan. Get help without raising suspicion about our potential involvement or sounding crazy. Jasper pulled out his phone and dialed 911. We left the gruesome room while he reported our findings, avoiding further exposure to that sickening sight. While waiting for the police to arrive, I couldn't help but keep an eye out for any movement around us. The hairs on the back of my neck refused to lie flat. I felt as if we were being watched. The reptilian creature was nowhere in sight, but its presence seemed to linger as a hostile reminder of what could be lurking nearby. The police arrived faster than expected, their concern driven by our account of the bloody scene. As they investigated the area and spoke with us further, I glanced around nervously. Was it truly gone, or merely hiding? Just as I turned towards Cassandra and Jasper, intending to discuss our next move, we heard one officer scream in pain and horror. Rushing over, I saw that he was clutching his arm, several long gashes freshly torn into his flesh. What happened? asked another officer as he tried to help his comrade. The injured officer panted heavily, as he struggled to find words through his pain. Something just attacked me. Like a big lizard, he gasped. A sudden panic set in within the small group of officers. Guns were drawn, radios crackled with urgent requests for backup, and every moving shadow seemed to be transformed into a potential threat. Cassandra, Jasper, and I huddled together trying to stay out of their way. Deep down, we knew that it must be the creature. 
It had come back for us or perhaps felt threatened by the police intrusion. Regardless of its agenda, we couldn't stay here any longer. I grabbed Cassandra's hand while Jasper led the way back towards our car. Every nerve in my body was on edge, my senses heightened by fear mixed with adrenaline. As we reached our vehicle, I swore I could hear the sharp scratching of claws on concrete just behind us. Jasper unlocked the car with shaking fingers, and we piled inside. He gunned the engine and sped away from that wretched warehouse as fast as legally acceptable. I don't know about you guys, I said between ragged breaths, but I'm never going back there. Cassandra and Jasper both nodded, their faces pale with a mixture of relief and lingering terror. In the following days, news reports flocked around the gruesome discovery at the warehouse. There was no mention of a reptilian creature. Only theories focused on gang violence or psychotic perpetrators on the loose. Little did they know about our horrifying encounter with what could only be described as an otherworldly predator. Something most assumed solely existed within the confines of fantastical stories or legends. We never spoke about it again amongst ourselves, a tacit agreement to leave it buried in the past. And although we tried to move forward with our lives, always wondering if someone else would cross paths with that malevolent presence, I knew that hiding deep within my memory was a horror that would stay with me forever. I am Charles McDuff, a private investigator based in Pittsburgh. My life used to be monotonous until the day everything changed. A mysterious case landed on my desk, reports of a missing person called Jenny Calhoun. In the gritty alleys of Pittsburgh, I began my investigation. The city was alive with life and noise, every corner teeming with stories waiting to be discovered. I found myself digging into Jenny's past, diving into her daily routines, contacts, and her interests. Jenny wasn't an ordinary person. She was a journalist fascinated with the urban legends of the Steel City. My investigation led me through libraries, archives, and interviews with other journalists. I stumbled upon a common thread among their stories. A humanoid wolf creature that was reported to prowl the city's darkest corners. Many tales surrounded this figure. Some said it was a misfit seeking justice, while others believed it was a rampant killer on the loose. One thing remained consistent, its tendency to remain elusive. Talking to Jenny's family didn't reveal much either. They were devastated by her disappearance and unsure of what could have led her down this path. To them, she was just doing her job like any other journalist. I continued my search in the darkest corners and alleys of Pittsburgh, where most would fear to tread. Piles of garbage are strewn about as people went about their business, unaffected by what might lurk in the shadows behind them. Then one evening, as I was walking down an alley near Liberty Avenue, I stumbled upon something horrifying. Sprawled out near a dumpster was the badly mutilated body of another missing person, Walter Zane. Anyone who passed by could see evidence of carnage in his earthly remains. Deep gashes and bite marks riddled his once living form. The crime scene didn't offer much evidence, but it prompted me to dig deeper into similar cases around Pittsburgh. The more I learned, the more I found connections to the elusive predator, the humanoid wolf creature. But what kind of animal could perpetrate such heinous acts? For a moment, I recalled an episode of The X-Files I watched as a teenager. Could it be anything like that? No, surely not. Reality isn't adapted from pulp fiction, but the idea dangled within my investigations. I started combing witnesses' accounts, poring over crime scenes, looking for anything that might have slipped past law enforcement. Every lead turned out to be a dead end, until I interviewed an old janitor named Oscar, who worked near a gym on Forbes Avenues. Oscar described an encounter in which he saw a hulking figure with fur and wolf-like features creep through the gym's parking lot under the cover of darkness. Too frightened to intervene or get a closer look, Oscar hid in his cleaning supply closet until dawn assured him it was safe to emerge. 
His eyewitness account provided me with something, a valuable piece of information about where the humanoid wolf might traverse or occasionally hunt. With time, however, dawned on me that catching such an elusive and dangerous creature might require help. So I contacted Jenny's friends and co-workers, forming an informal team of investigators. One night, we equipped ourselves with flashlights, pepper spray, and other self-defense tools, embarking on a stakeout of one of the areas where we suspected this monster could frequent. We hid in different shadows and corners, waiting for something to pass by, unknown what we might find. Hours passed, and Oscar and I started to believe we were chasing shadows. Suddenly, we heard a guttural growl from behind the gym. Out of instinct, our group scrambled to communicate with each other, whispering to confirm everyone's safety. We agreed to approach the source of the noise cautiously. We knew if something went wrong, calling for help might not be fast enough to save us. As we got closer to the gym's backside, I noticed blood dripping from a nearby trash can, leading towards a gap in the fence. Fear crept inside me, but I pushed it back and focused on every step I took. Heart pounding, we peered through the fence into the adjacent alleyway. There, we found a horrific scene. One of Jenny's co-workers, Sarah, lay lifeless on the ground. Blood pooled around her mauled body. No time for grief or shock. We could hear rustling nearby. A moment later, the creature emerged from the darkness. The massive, wolf-like humanoid stood on its hind legs with razor-sharp teeth, exposed in a snarl while blood dripped from its claws. The sight confirmed Oscar's account and exceeded my worst fears. Paralyzed by terror, my companions and I knew that confronting this beast was impossible without learning more about it first. Instead of calling for help and potentially drawing attention to ourselves from the monster, which would put everyone in danger, or worse, having no one believes us, we decided to focus on hiding and observing. Desperation took over as it felt like there was no escape or way to overcome this monstrosity without risking more lives. I signaled my team to move towards a side entrance of the gym, where it was still dark enough not to be seen by the creature as it moved further down the alleyway. Whispered voices caused alarmed chatter about Sarah while trying to piece together what happened. As much as we wanted to report the attack, Making a phone call would draw attention, and none of us knew who or how to call to fight such an unknown creature. All we could do was plan to notify the police once we had put some distance between ourselves and the beast. We remained hidden, listening as its breathing grew heavier, a sign that it was getting agitated. Finally, it turned its attention away from us long enough for our group to find another hiding spot inside the gym's basement. There... We huddled in terrified silence, praying that it wouldn't catch our scent and find its way down to us. After what seemed like an eternity, we heard footsteps above us begin to subside. Gathering every ounce of courage, I decided it was time for my team to make their way out of the gym and contact the police. In our panicked state, our thoughts raced. If anyone even entertained our claims, what could they do? we weighed the risks of explaining what we saw versus holding on to information that could lead to more tragedies. I began documenting every detail from our encounter with the monster, where we saw it, specific features, and its apparent strength. I held on to my notes and waited while my friends called emergency services one by one. We all shared versions of what happened without diving into too much detail about what attacked Sarah. As much as we wanted to scream out that there was a werewolf-like creature on the loose, based on what logic could suggest, our fear of disbelief kept us from doing so. As soon as Jenny's group words finally reached law enforcement, they arrived at the scene. Seeing Sarah's mangled body with their own eyes left them perplexed and feeling helpless in finding her attacker. Our little band of investigators disbanded after the official investigation began. In our hearts, we knew something beyond human comprehension had terrified us forever. An unknown predator prowling throughout these streets at night. Too many lives had been lost already. 
but we could never unveil what we knew and endured. Paranormal creatures like werewolves were out of the public's understanding, things that belonged to fiction tales, stories too outlandish to face acknowledgement. Wrapped in our own thoughts and fearing becoming targets again, each one of us tried to forget about the inhuman adversary that now haunted our dreams. This happened back when I was working as a fishing guide down in the 10,000 Islands. Folks hire out guys like me to take them out for the snook and tarpon. Name's Terry, by the way. I grew up in these parts. Old Florida blood. The kind who knew how to run a trot line and gig flounder before we could talk good. Most tourists see the Everglades as some exotic adventure. But for me, it was just home. Knew the way the tides shifted. How to read the clouds the tangle of mangroves like the back of my hand. Reckoned nothing out there was going to get the best of me. Reckoned wrong. The day started off ordinary. Had a client booked, businessman type, up from Miami, more money than sense. Wanted to land the big one, something to brag about at the country club. We headed out around dawn, the sun just turning the water to molten gold. Usually I steer folks toward more open spots, less chance of snags, easier for casting, especially with beginners. But this fella had a hankering to head up river, said he wanted the authentic experience. Not my first rodeo with those types, so I took him up the Lopez, deeper into the thick of it. Now, even up river, the water's usually clear enough to see five, six feet down, but that day it was murky. Had rained hard up north the previous week. Probably washed a bunch of tannins in. I figured fishing would be tougher, but the client was insistent. We found a spot where the river curved, nice calm pool, cypress trees all around. He started flinging his line, me offering the occasional pointer the way you do to humor them. Place felt off somehow. The quiet was too thick. Even the birdsong had dropped off, replaced by the non-stop whine of mosquitoes. I was starting to get itchy to head back downstream when the client let out a whoop. His line straightened, pole bending something fierce like he'd snagged a submerged log. Then the log moved. The water exploded. Whatever was on the hook, it was huge. I rushed over to help, but the thing took off downriver, dragging the line with it caught a glimpse of something dark and scaly break the surface, no fish I'd ever seen. The businessman was shouting, half excited, half terrified, and the reel kept whirring. That's when the other line snagged, just jerked tight, no warning. That's the thing about the back country. Sometimes you snag on branches, roots, sometimes, well, sometimes you snag on things with teeth. My blood ran cold. I knew that second line wasn't a fish. I looked at my client, saw his face change from thrill to something deeper. A flicker of primal fear. Cut the lines, I yelled at him. He stumbled, fumbling for his knife, but it was too late. The boat lurched forward. Not like a fish strike, like something had grabbed hold of the whole damn thing and was yanking us upstream. My client screamed, lost his footing, went right over the side. I reacted without thinking, leaped in after him, surfaced next to him as the boat spun in circles, dragging us along. Got him by the collar, tried to haul him back in, but the pull was too strong, the water too clouded to see what had us. Then I saw it. An eye, bigger than my fist, staring out of the murky water below the boat. Yellow, with a vertical slit like a cat's. A tangle of dark limbs churned below that and a snout full of needle teeth. Get to the shore! I screamed at the client, kicking hard. Panic gave him strength. He thrashed his way toward a clump of mangroves and I followed, heart pounding like a drum in my ears. Just as I reached the roots, I felt a jolt to my leg. Something had clamped onto my boot, tried to drag me under. I kicked back, blind and desperate, heard a tearing sound and the grip loosened burst from the water, 
scrambling into the tangled branches. Client was already there, sobbing. Didn't blame him. Took a moment to catch my breath, then turned to look back at the boat. It was half underwater, lodged onto a half-submerged tree trunk like a beached whale, slowly being dragged downstream, stern first. We watched it disappear around the bend, the sound of splintering wood echoing through the swamp, and under the surface just for a second. I swear I saw that massive, scaly shape gliding after it. We didn't talk much on the hike back to civilization. What was there to say? Client never came back down to the Everglades as far as I know, and I couldn't blame him. Found my mangled boot a week later. Tooth marks sunk deep in the leather. Reckon most folks wouldn't believe us if we told them. Write it off as an alligator attack, maybe an escaped python. But I know what I saw, and I know it wasn't any creature meant for the guidebook. The old timers, the Mikasuki who lived out here longer than anyone, they have stories about something in the deepest swamps, something left over from an older time. Call it the Lizard King. Say it guards the old places, the water holes only the elders know about. Maybe they're just tall tales to keep tourists away. Maybe not. These days, any time I'm out on the backwaters and that feeling starts to prickle in my bones, the sense that something's watching, I turn the boat around, fast as I can. Don't go poking around the shadowed parts of the world. That's my advice. Some things, they're better off left alone. This happened to me on October 22, 1999. I'll never forget that day, not as long as I live. Maybe never is what it waits for out there. My name's Travis Bishop. Been working search and rescue out of Yellowstone National Park since I was barely old enough to shave. Married now, although the missus keeps giving me that look. The one that says she's getting real tired of the long nights and whispered nightmares. Can't say I blame her. Sometimes I get tired of them too. We got the call about some out-of-state hikers gone missing on an overnight trip. Couple of city slickers figured they could handle the backcountry trails with just some fancy walking sticks and an app on their phones. Routine enough, though that nagging feeling settled in my gut. The one that means trouble's brewing. My partner, Russ, felt it too. You spend enough time out here, you get a sixth sense about when the wilderness is holding its breath. We found their car parked all the way out at a remote trailhead, Wyoming plates shining in the morning sun. The trail wound through thick stands of lodgepole pine, sunlight barely making it through to the forest floor. That part of Yellowstone gets quiet. Not the peaceful kind, but the kind that hums in your ears, makes every crack of a branch echo like a gunshot. Russ started cracking jokes, but his voice felt forced in the heavy air. Even way out here, you can still smell the sulfur sometimes, rising up from the geysers and hot springs, mixing with the scent of pine. That day, it smelled wrong, like old metal and fear. We came across their campsite as the afternoon wore long. Whatever we were half expecting, it wasn't this. The tent looked like it had been ripped apart by a tornado, not a bear, but by something with claws, big enough to leave gashes a foot long in the nylon. Their backpacks were gutted, their fancy freeze-dried meals scattered, sleeping bags torn open, stuffing scattered like snowdrifts under the trees. But the blood, that was what turned my stomach. Smeared on the rocks, on the ground, sticky and dark in the fading light, and the smell. Iron sharp and wrong mixed with the pine scent, a smell that I'd never smelled before, but would know in my nightmares for years to come. Called it in on the radio, voice shaky, even though I told myself to get a grip. No answer. Just that cursed static that always seems to roll in like fog when you really need backup. Russ looked grim. We agreed to split up. He'd follow the blood trail as long as he could. I'd try to reach higher ground, get enough elevation for the damn radio signal. 
He left me with a clapped shoulder and a worried look that didn't sit right on his usually easygoing face. The forest felt like it was closing in as I hiked, branches reaching like skeletal fingers, the undergrowth thick and clinging. Sun was already dropping, painting long shadows on the ground. Then I saw them, the tracks. Not elk, not deer, not any animal I recognized. Prints massive, toes splayed wide, each claw mark a deep gouge in the dirt. I crouched down, tried to keep my hands steady. Whatever made those tracks, it was big, powerful, and recent. Then a new sound, a low snarl, coming from deeper in the trees. I froze, rifle raised, but there was nothing to see, just the shifting shadows. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. Whatever was out there was smart, stalking me, circling. I took off running, heart pounding. I weaved through the trees, the underbrush tearing at my clothes, branches snapping in my wake. Tripped over a fallen log, scrambled to my feet just as the thing burst from the tree line, built like a wolf, but taller, standing almost as high as I did on its hind legs, fur matted and dark, eyes burning yellow in the twilight, claws longer than my fingers, teeth bared in a snarl that sent shivers down my spine. It wasn't natural, not anything that belonged in these woods, something old and wrong, something twisted into being by the whispers you hear in the rustle of wind through the trees and the silence that stretches on and on. A shot rang out. Russ. I'd forgotten about him. Heart sinking as I realized he must be close, maybe drawing its attention away from me. But then it turned its head towards the gunshot, lowering its bulk, eyes narrowing, and in that moment, I saw a flicker of something in its gaze that chilled me deeper than the mountain air. Cold intelligence. I fired my rifle, the sound echoing through the trees. It jerked back, let out a roar that shook me to my bones. My shot went wild, hitting a tree and sending bark exploding into the air. In the confusion I turned and ran, not looking back, just scrambling desperately. The thing could outpace me easily, but maybe, maybe I could buy enough time, lead it away from Russ. I heard Russ yell, a sharp, terrified sound cut short. Then another roar, closer this time. I chanced to glance back, and just for a second, I saw it. A dark blur bounding away from the spot where Russ must have fallen. My legs moved like pistons, fear propelling me faster than I thought possible. The sounds of the chase faded behind me, but the thing knew these woods better than me. It could be circling back, watching me, waiting for my exhaustion to slow me down. Took the rest of the night to find my way back to the trailhead, following the moonlight and trying not to imagine those yellow eyes watching from the darkness. Found Russ, lying by their car, throat ripped open, staring sightlessly at the sky. I knelt beside him, choked back a sob. My report detailed a possible rogue bear encounter. The truth swallowed back down. Folks around here, even other rangers, they don't take kindly to stories about things that don't fit on the maps. Don't play nice with the tourist brochures. The bodies of those city slickers were never found. Some nights, I look at my wife sleeping peacefully beside me, and I think about Russ, about those bloody tracks in the twilight, about what shredded their tent and left them as nothing but stains on the earth. I think about what might have happened if my shot had found its mark that day, if I'd seen it fall. Some secrets, some shadows. They hide in plain sight in the wild places. Some things lurk out there, old as the hills and smart enough to know most folks won't believe their eyes. Maybe it's better that way. Maybe what really haunts a man is not what he sees, but what he can't explain away. The glimpse behind the curtain that reminds him of just how small a space humanity really lives in. How little he knows about where the trails end and the untamed dark begins. It was probably five years back when it happened. 
I was fresh out of ranger school, full of big ideas about saving the environment, protecting the wildlife, all that good stuff. Seemed like the Everglades was the perfect place to start, if you can stomach the humidity and the bugs. My name's Kellen, Kellen Parks. I was assigned to Fakahachi Strand, way down south, the heart of the 10,000 islands. It's wild down there, thick cypress forests, tangled mangrove roots twisting up out of the water, sawgrass prairies stretching as far as the eye can see. Not as many people venture out that far, but that was just fine by me. Liked the quiet, liked being alone with the land and the critters. There used to be an old hunting camp out in the middle of the preserve, a little clearing up on a hammock with a rusted-out Airstream trailer and a shed. Rangers had stopped patrolling that route regularly a few years back, said it wasn't worth the manpower. Figured folks smart enough to trek that far into the wilderness wouldn't be causing much trouble anyway. Turns out, sometimes folks do crazy things. A group of hikers had been reported missing, last seen heading off the boardwalk trail towards that old camp. My supervisor asked if I could take a jeep out, do a sweep of the area, put up some signs at least. Seemed simple enough. I rolled up to the clearing in the late afternoon. Sun beat down through the branches and the air shimmered with heat. Place was quiet. You ever get that feeling? Like you're being watched, even if you don't see anyone around? Well, I had it, strong. I found what was left of the hikers a few yards back into the trees. They hadn't been natural deaths, if you get my meaning. Tore up in a way no gator or panther would do. I radioed it in, sick to my stomach. Told my supervisor I didn't feel safe waiting for backup alone out there. He said help was on the way, but they wouldn't make it till morning. I didn't head back to the jeep though. Didn't know why. Reckon there's something inside us that wants to know. Even when the smarter part of your brain screams to run. Maybe that's what makes someone a ranger. Or maybe it makes us dumb as rocks. I followed a trail of broken branches and disturbed undergrowth deeper into the trees. Came across the shed just as the sun was setting. Painting the swamp in streaks of orange and blood red. Sounded like something was moving in the shadows underneath it figured it was a deer or a raccoon, so I called out to scare it off. Didn't want whatever it was coming at me in the dark. But nothing ran out. Something shifted beneath the shed, though. Something big. I drew my gun, took a slow step closer, the smell of rot and decay nearly gagging me. And that's when I saw it. Thing was tall, even hunched over like it was. Pale white skin stretched tight over bone like it was half-starved. Eyes were big and sunk deep in its skull, staring right out at me. Empty, like it didn't recognize me as a person. Its mouth opened, a low hissing sound escaping its throat. That's when I saw the teeth. Too many, sharp and jagged, stained red with blood that wasn't its own. My hand tightened on the gun, but my finger froze on the trigger. Some part of me knew shooting was pointless. This wasn't an animal, not one I'd ever seen in a textbook. It took a rattling step closer, its head tipped at an odd angle, its neck bent in a way that shouldn't be possible. That's when I turned and ran. Didn't bother looking back, just tore through the cypress knees and tangled roots, the rasp and hiss of the thing chasing at my heels. Branches whipped at my face, mud sucked on my boots. Stumbled and fell into a patch of sawgrass, the sharp blades cutting my hands. Didn't stop. Scrambled to my feet and kept running. Knew if I stopped it would be over. That thing would sink its teeth into my flesh, rip me apart like it had those hikers. I burst out of the trees right as the twilight slipped away into full darkness. There were voices, headlamps flashing across the clearing. The relief that hit me nearly made my legs buckle. Backup had arrived. A swarm of rangers poured into the trees, armed and shouting. I pointed them in the direction of that shed, collapsed onto the rough ground, gasping for breath. They scoured the area, searched for hours, found no sign of whatever that creature was. I gave a statement, but the look the head ranger gave me said it all. 
probably thought I'd gone nuts from the heat and the shock of finding the bodies. Maybe they even wrote the whole thing off as bear attack. I was cleared to go back to work a week later. Never went back to the Fakahachi Strand, though. I'll patrol the tourist-filled boardwalks now, thank you very much. You'd think after seeing something like that, you'd stop believing in anything weird. But that's not how it works. I hear the stories the old-timers tell. Legends of the swamp. Things that lurk in the shadows where the light can't reach. Now I look out at the sawgrass prairies, at the dark tangles of the mangroves and cypress swamps, and I wonder. They call it the skunk ape, the booger, the swamp monster. Maybe the thing that stalked me in the fading twilight had a name once, in a world older than ours. I don't know. All I know is I saw something real out there. And sometimes, when the moon is just a sliver and the swamp fog rolls in thick, I think I can still hear its hissing breaths echoing in the stillness.